Hello, Danger Noodles. I am here alone. No one else is here with me. Then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying... Can you stop jackaster, jackassing around, please? <laughs> one more look. What's that? Look at voice chat. Oh! oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it was a white horse. And those who said... <laughs> Ah, shit! <laughs> when he broke the second... Are you okay, Momo? <laughs> oh, break keeps muting hatchet. And another, a red horse went... Oh, wait, you know what's actually funny? I can mute them and do this. Sodium, 250 milligrams. Total carbohydrate, <laughs> 15 grams. <laughs> I think <that> <laughs> This is a blatant abuse of power. <laughs> I didn't know that because that was stupid. Oh. A Christian that one by one to be read. Anyway, righteous are you, O oh Lord. I'm done. I will... I'm, done. <laughs> I'm done. Like I said, I have the bag right here, motherfucker. <laughs> Go right ahead, motherfucker. I've got calories one hundred and seventy. Total fat living grams. <laughs> Hear this, oh no, house of so so who are named Israel and who came from the lions hey, of hey, Judah. Hey, 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 hey! I'm gonna say <laughs> moon's back. Oh, calm moon's back. Every, calm your, calm your stuff down, everyone. Calm all of your tits all over the place. I'm Jesus. <laughs> Hello, Rian. Bright and I have not been bickering at all with Bright trying yes, to. Yes, you have. Bright, Bright was not at all trying to break me with nutrients, and I was not at all reading from the gut from, from um, Revelations. Now I don't know what you're talking about. Let's move on. What are we doing here? Cheers. Uh... <laughs> slowly losing brain cells. I feel like. I might be one of the only adults here besides Momo who's just being a taking a different adult approach and just staying the hell out of this, which Mo I respect. I really oh. don't have like any sort of dog in this fight, so yeah, no. M Momo's just cowering in the corner. <laughs> He's kind of waiting. I walked in with the pizza, and now I'm not sure what to do with it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like Troy from Community. <laughs> he walks in, his whole apartment's on fire. Wait, I have an idea of the plan. Hey, hey, how about instead of you doing whatever the heck you, you're doing, we start the reading. Yeah. Was that blue bar where we are now? Yeah, what the fuck is that? It was what? Oh. It was like a blue bar on screen. <laughs> what is what? I didn't put a blue bar on the screen. It was yeah, showing up did. on the Discord stream. Oh, I see. They're moving where chat is. Now chat's being moved to in front of the book. Oh. I am the book now. Bright, can you can we start? Yeah. Well, Bright's no, no, You are the 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 person, so you do the thing first. Uh, yeah. So how does this work? We just have people read, and then any bloopers you edit into a blooper video later, and just edit around the missteps. Yeah. Okay. Dead silence. <laughs> I guess Momo's not ready. So I'm, I'm sorry. Hang on. Y'all want me to? Okay. <laughs> I can fill the silence with something. Please. Please. Don't. Please. Don't. <laughs> Thank you. I won't. I won't. I won't. <laughs> I won't. I'm done being I, obnoxious I for now. I appreciate your devotion to um, whatever it is that you do. 
but it's it's called <laughs> meme. It's called the meme. <laughs> I anyway. have a distinctly different taste in memes. Okay, I guess this is uh yeah. Guess I'm gonna start reading. Add on. <clears throat> the origin Aaron Bright, y'all. On a starless night at sight redacted, Aaron Bright is awakened by the loud, incessant beeping of their alarm clock. Noticing that it was 8 p.m., Aaron begrudgingly pulled herself out of up and out of bed. She trudged to the closet, got herself dressed in her uniform, and grabbed her level four clearance key card. Guess it's gonna be another shitty day with 035 again. She said with a yawn as she stepped out of her cell, left open for her as she embarked on this day's task. Oh, hey, Bright. A person from the wayside asked, with only exhaustion to back it up. The individual was one Dr. Inigo Rattler. They had warm brown skin, and, the indi- and, and his indigo blue eyes shone, uh, shone brightly their wavy orange hair that trailed down their back. Like thin, winding vines, it caused them to stand out a little more than the others, who was a stranger to no one. You know, Dr. Aller, you're supposed to refer to me as Dr. Bright, right? Oh, right. Sorry, Dr. Bright. Dr. Rattler uttered flatly. Hey, just be glad I'm not the other level fours. Try and remember to call me that next time. She warned Dr. Rattler's casual uh, she warned Dr. Rattler casually since the same mistake could not be made with a few of the other level 4s. Dr. Rattler was a level 3 medical professional, meaning his casual demeanor could be perceived as improper by those who ranked higher. Dr. Bright repositioned her stance so that it would uh, be more comfortable to continue a lengthier conversation. Well, I'm assuming there is is a reason you're in front of my door. Oh, if I may Dr. Rattler paused, as though he had several things to speak about. But instead, he lifts a stack of papers and in front of Dr. Bright for her to take. Aaron looks, confuse, looked, looks confusingly at the papers, but grabs the documents out of Dr. Rattler's hands, as though they had been called, uh, they had been through this routine before. The documents appeared to contain orders from the O5 Council. Dr. Bright's eyes began to widen in shock as she skims through the contents. Uh, why on earth do they want me to watch a Class D personnel go in, into SCP-579's containment cell? It's an anti-meme. We never know what it looks like or what it does as a D-Class after it, we leave the observation deck. Also, why on earth did they give me a copy of SCP-963? We all know it doesn't work like the original. Aaron exclaimed angrily, as though someone had just allowed her to be used like a free-for-all punching bag to, to let out their own stupid steam. Um, it's what they want. Dr. Rattler said hesitantly in response to Bright's outburst. Uh, sorry, shouldn't have yelled. Aaron sighed. Guess I have to deal with this shit. See you later, Dr. Rattler. See you later, Dr. Aaron. Yeah, you got, Aaron. you got you got cut out, right? Did I? Yeah, I just kind of assumed you finished talking. Well, it, it picked it up on stream, thankfully. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Good. If if it gets cut off in Discord, it always picks up on stream. I gotcha, gotcha. But anyway, just in case. Oh jeez. There. Are you okay? Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. I wondered what happened at first, and then sorry. yeah. Aaron Bright then proceeds to head uh, down to deep containment, eventually arriving at SCP five nine seven five seven nine's containment cell. She then approaches the two guards in the D class. 
So this is a D class. Going to five seven nine's containment cell. She said, looking at the, a depressed, disheveled young Caucasian man in an orange jumpsuit. The guard on the left spoke. Yes, ma'am. That is the D class we will be using today. Aaron sighed and said, <sighs> "All right, let's get this over with. Send him in when I get to the observation deck." Yes, ma'am. The guards responded. Aaron proceeded to the observation deck and reached the control panel. She opened the cell doors and used the microphone to tell the guards to send in the D-Class. Aaron then pressed the cell button and the cell doors closed. All right, D-Class. Do you see anything? No response came through for 10 minutes. D-9873456. Do you or do you not See anything? Before she could finish, the observation glass shattered. Alarms were activated along with high-pitched screaming coming from the observation deck. Both guards quickly investigated the common commotion with their guns in hand. But all they found was the lifeless corks of Dr. Aaron Bright. Wrapped around her wrist was what appeared to be a copy of SCP-963 though with a pitch black gem rather than the crimson red of the original. This new amulet was later designated as SCP-963-3. One guard took the amulet into containment to be studied, and the other guard called for backup. SCP-579 was believed to, be return to, believed to have returned to the containment cell, and the body of Dr. Aaron Bright was cremated. Would the um, Discord ping have come through the stream and no. thus show up? Okay. In an interrogation room not far away from SCP-579's... Five, God, I keep doing that. <laughs> 579's containment cell. Agent Redacted, one of the seven agents that worked on SCP-579, ordered D-Class 27582356 to put on... SCP-963-3. The lady, suffering from albinism, had pure white hair, pinkish-red eyes, and a lean physique. Picked up, uh, picked up the amulet and placed it on herself. What, what the hell? Where the fuck am I? Who the hell are you? The D-Class shrieked out, gasping for air, and trying to piece together what was happening to her. The agent doesn't seem surprised by this, and said calmly, I am agent, and you are at the SCP Foundation. I know you must be shocked, but please try to remain calm. Take a seat and allow me to explain. Uh, hey, uh, okay, I'll listen. They said, while pulling out, and sitting in the chair. The agent leaned forward on the table. Three days ago, you were killed when a breach of SCP-579 occurred. We aren't sure why this happened and why it attacked you. If you don't mind me asking, do you know who you are? No, I don't. Why do I know? She stammered, attempting to remember. Her fear began showing more on her face while trying to rationalize the situation. The agent, with a collected tone, said, You're safe now. There's nothing to worry about. I do believe you to be Dr. Aaron Bright, seeing as they were the only one who came in contact with the amulet. We are calling it SCP-96. Nine-sex? Nine -sex? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm trying to keep my fucking composure. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, now you see why the last recording session, besides all the editing, was such a shit show. Nine <laughs> sex. <laughs> I stumble over my words so frequently. Okay. It's okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's okay. It's a vibe. Listen, I'm just making extra content, okay?
That's that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> we- Why did a cat just meowed right next to me a second I got it? That's another blooper. <laughs> that's another blooper right there. <laughs> that motherfucking cat just interrupts my train of thought. Trying to be serious, and then there's a cat behind them calling for attention. Fucking dicks. Okay. We are calling it SCP-963-3. I'm not an expert with dealing with psychological trauma, thus I'm going to leave you in the hands of your only doctor friend. (laughs) Who are they? You will find out when you leave the room. The agent stood and helped her to the exit of the air interrogation room, opening the door. A tired and worried doctor holding a cup of coffee, cold coffee, while sitting in the chair in the outside room. Outside the room, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, that's Hatchet Oh, sorry. Gosh. <laughs> that's a blooper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start over again. I'm sorry. I'll start yeah. over again. I'm sorry. Yeah, do we want to just... Yeah. Uh, start back from. I'll start. Uh, I'll start from the retired. agent. Tired. Okay, the agent. Okay. Yeah. The agent stood and helped her to the exit of the interrogation room, opening the door. A tired and worried doctor holding a cup of cold coffee while sitting in the chair outside the room. What do I tell her? <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Why did I say Elric? All right, Edward. Uh, Edward Elric. You dog of the military, you. Normal, no, Momo. You see, that's the thing. In, in previous times, I was mixing up Aaron as Aaron Jaeger, <laughs> but this time somehow I imported El- Elric. Jesus. <laughs> I haven't even watched Full Metal Alchemist any time recently. Why did that pop up? God damn it! It's a good, it's a good show. Full Metal Alchemist. I need Full to Metal watch Alchemist. the original. Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> yes. I need to watch the original. I've heard good things about it as well as Brotherhood. It's 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 good. It's yeah. good. I, I okay. So I know that Brotherhood. Topic, but... Oh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, on the topic of that, like, um, I oh, like the, I liked both. I liked both series. I like both both versions, but um, I like, um. I like the original. I like the original better for like the characters and everything. So there were some good character moments in the original one. The original had to work with what they had, and the full manga wasn't out at the time. Exactly. Yeah. So then, Brotherhood was made to properly adapt the manga. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Where the fuck was I? You, you all right, they Aaron. didn't even finish the sentence. Yeah. yeah I, I said all right, Elric, and then broke down. Yeah. All right, let's let's go. All right, Aaron. This person Are you fucking kidding me? My brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> My brain. <laughs> My brain just took a shit on itself, okay. All right. All right, Aaron. This person here is your friend, Dr. Rattler. They're going to try and help you with your memories. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just typing something. <laughs> oh, yeah, and with the... um, With the person who speaks over the microphone, Adern, are you gonna... Plan on doing that? Yeah, I, I can do it as long as you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, hear you. I can hear you. <sighs> Dr. Rattler got up and wor- worriedly said, You can call me Indigo if you want to. Please come with me. I promise to help you out as best as I can. Aaron hesitantly followed them. After a long walk, they arrived inside a large containment cell. The room houses normal amounts of grass, multiple UV lights on the ceiling, and a tall, weeping willow-like tree with indigo-colored peppers. 
Dr. Rattler then said. Please wait here. I'm going to try to get my pet. <clears throat> Blooper. <laughs> Please wait here. I'm going to go to my pepper tree and pick some of the peppers off to help your memory. Tongue twister. Excuse me, why would a pepper tree help me? I, I, I don't see how that could help me out in any way. Said Bright, agitated while looking at Inigo. Before Dr. Rattler spoke, they finished the last of their coffee and threw it away in a recycle bin. They then took a deep breath to relieve the stress. Oh, right. You wouldn't remember anything about my tree or the pepper. Put it simply, I had a pepper tree seed that came from my hair. I gave it to the O5 Council after joining... I gave it to the O5 Council after joining the Foundation. Grew into a big pepper tree after a while and produced peppers with special effects. I'm sorry, a seed in your hair and special effects? Bright question, looking more than baffled. The tree is its own anomalous entity. As for the peppers, they give cognitive effects such as helping with memory loss. Muttered Dr. Rattler in hopes of explaining things to Aaron. Sorry, sorry. If you wait here. Oh, gosh. Sorry for my. If you wait here, I will be. If you wait here, I will be right back with peppers. Now we need to get water because my throat is going. That's Ooh, fair. I know the mess. I'm going to pop it. My throat's not happy. Why don't we just take a pause right now? That might be a good idea. Cause... I'm good on that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, literally, after I do my line, Momo speaks, then cheery. <laughs> yeah. SCP-9 sex. <laughs> yeah, book we'll clip 9 sex. Woo! Hey, Hatchet, did you what? hear me? No. Book we'll clipped it. Very good. That's, that's, that's yeah. very good. That's what we want. Oh, oh. sorry. Well, that was a lot faster than I thought it would be. Yeah, we, we have water nearby. Ah. Sorry, once again. You're fine. Actual you voice go. is very deep, and not speaking it for some reason is a lot harder in Southern California than it was. Jerry, I've for three years I did voice acting gig. I, I understand having water for voices. You're you're fine. <laughs> I frick I freaking did almost all of the voice acting for Bright's kindergarten streams. Yeah, both me and Hatchet understand. <laughs> yeah, but you typically don't have to fight with yourself to use your own voice. I did. True. With uh, one of my oh. voices. Yeah. With all those voices you hear me do, I had to fight myself to get my body used to it. No, I mean your own voice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, my default the default voice I use is something I've turned into my customer service voice, but it's literally the people are ableist and racist and I need to make myself look unthreatening so they don't hurt me. Voice. Anyway. Yeah. Fuck. Anyways, I'll read my thing. <clears throat> uh, I think I'll just stay here and try to process this. Aaron sat down, trying to comprehend what Dr. Rattler had just said to them. Dr. Rattler ran over to the pepper tree before picking three fresh peppers, swiftly returning after to find Aaron twiddling with the grass near her. Here, take one of these. They should help you get some memories back," said Doctor Rattler. Y "You sure this is gonna work? I feel like something's bad's gonna happen if I use this." 
Aaron said hesitantly while looking at the peppers. Yes, they should help you become better and remember what you have lost. If you say so. All you have to do to use these peppers is to... Dr. Rattler began to say. Bright hastily bit into one of the peppers before Rattler could finish talking. Aaron began grasping at the he at their head and coughing from the heat. Don't tell me you ate it. You're supposed to hold it, exclaimed Inigo. All of Aaron Bright's horrible and painful memories came rushing into her mind. Procedure 110 Montauk. What happens to D-Class at the end of the month? The deaths of so many good friends to SCPs and much more came flooding back all at once. This, this place is an absolute hell, a death trap! She yelled out before collapsing. Guards rushed in and hoisted her to another room. Indigo watched the scene with a horrified expression, his face going pale with anxiety and concern. Aaron, I'm so sorry. They said mournfully. I meant to. Aaron, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was simply going to mention. You know, one of one of my determiners of a good story comes from me being able to have a similar or a notably positive reaction on a rewatch, right? Mm-hmm. I am proud to say that the line of you just randomly grabbing and eating the peppers still does nothing but give me a smile. <laughs> the brain peppers you weren't supposed to eat. And she said, eat them anyway, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, it, it's like, it's the sort of thing where, again, it's like, I try to rationalize it and I think... What character would do this in the middle of being explained to it? And then I remember this character is Bright. <laughs> Bright has well, to be fair, like, like Bright has literally done shit like that, like almost constantly oh, yeah. when I try to explain something to her. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, that's yeah. <laughs> Act first, then see what happens, as opposed to like having somebody explain it to them, because you, you could see. Dr. Rattler was getting ready to tell them what the whole deal with the peppers was. But... <laughs> and Bright's just it's... like, hmm, nom. He's like, yeah, no, nah, I, can, I, can, I can place this in my mouth. Oh, what is this spicy Cheeto? Ooh, hot fries. Um... But anyway. Okay, Momo, the funniest thing is that you missed about this from like the, la the last time was Bright was literally eating hot cheat literally eating hot Cheetos while doing after doing that. Yeah, I did that. that. I did that for the yelling scene. So I thought that would be better, but I didn't want to do it again. I didn't want to do fucking, it again. You fucking freak. I love it. I fucking oh, forgot sensational. that. Sensational. Why was like, let me get in character, start eating spicy hot Cheetos. Start hawking down fucking hot fries. Hell like no. I, like, I don't take you to be any sort of a method actor, Bray, but, uh... <laughs> I guess she tried it and she didn't like it! Aaron awoke in another room with a CRT TV before she was startled by a booming voice over the microphone. Uh, Aderna? Oh, Aderna. Yeah, Aderna, right? Yeah. Yep. Sorry. I'll just say it one more time. Hang on, you're good. I got it. Aaron awoke in another room with a CRT TV before she was startled by a booming voice over the microphone. I know. I know you've been through a lot recent. <laughs> okay. Did you guys get the first part of that? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I just couldn't tell because, like, I couldn't see my thing light up one sec. Oh, uh, that's fine. That's okay. fine. It just opens up for more bloopers. Very uh, different well, caliber of blooper. That, that's not really. That's not really bloop. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
I know you've been through a lot recently, but I do believe that SCP-230 can help you deal with what happened to you earlier. Aaron jumped from her chair, threw it against the wall, and screamed at the voice. Why the hell should I do this, you devils? The voice grew louder over the speakers. If you don't do it, we have ways of making you. <laughs> As if that scares me. You, whatever you want, you massive okay. shitty asshole. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Oh, the microphone just quietly goes oh okay <laughs> <laughs> i'll redo that you got this go ahead <laughs> as if that scares me do whatever you want you massive shitty assholes i'm not doing anything you say she yelled with pure anger a door to the left side of the room opened and two fully armed guards entered. Without saying a word, they started restraining Aaron to the chair. Get the hell off me, you bastardized pieces of shit! She exclaimed viciously. The guards ignored her, picked up the VHS tape, and placed it in the VCR. Both guards headed outside the door and left the room before the VCR started playing the episode. I, I told you, we have ways of making you watch this. You should have done as you were told. Go right in hell, you asshole! Aaron said, shaking and clawing at the restraint. Before Aaron could continue insulting, the episode had started playing. A weird motion of characters appeared on screen and did horrific things no one should have gone through. Suddenly, a very tall laughing person in a suit came on screen, telling everyone to laugh. What the fuck is this shit you're having me watch? Before anyone could answer her, all of the lights went out and then back on again. Aaron was sitting on the stage with an imposing figure in front of them. And that's it. That's chapter one. Also, uh, <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> the rewrite made things a little different, right? Yeah. So, before I hop off, because I do need to mm -hmm. go, right, most likely, um, I, I, I want to take a moment to mm -hmm. uh, reiterate to Momo, what has it been like engaging in these editing streams? Because the first time we did this was basically an attempt at doing exactly what we just did in about an, a half hour. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that turned into an editing stream that lasted, oh, what was it, like four or five hours? Or Jeez. More. Um, and, like, th this is something we've mentioned a lot. We love Bright, and she's got a good idea here. But as it stands, her writing's kind of abysmal. High school system loves me. <laughs> so, like, it's it's commonly turned into us just desperately trying to figure out what Bright was meaning. And then after that, more recently, uh, like, giving Bright an idea of what we think needs to be clarified. And then trying to get Bright to write something with her own words. Because early on, I started doing too much of the writing. And making it so that bright probably wasn't learning as much as she should be i think part of chapter one was some of my writing too yeah i also it butted in a bit too much with chapter one because at the time we were all exhausted i was tired i was irritated yeah. but i i wanted to just highlight two things that are really funny one is in the second chapter there's an entire paragraph that was a total nightmare to figure out how to rework yeah that uh basically the entire paragraph was one run on sentence oh, yeah. and it 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 included the reason why my name is what it is right now in discord server where bright at one point had laffy say uh well 
What was the exact thing? That man that I had do very extremely dangerous factory work. Yeah. <laughs> I the there are certain things that um it depends. It feel like I feel like there are certain things that you um should explain and there are certain things that, that don't necessarily need no explanation um and that's one of the things that doesn't need an explanation <laughs> there are certain things yeah like i would have liked to have known on i know you can't really get into too many specifics on twitch but like i would have liked to have known exactly what was on that tape we actually momo all the writing horror streams are vods on the vod channel Oh, right on. Okay. I yeah. will, yeah. Yeah, so I'll probably, yeah, like I said, some of those I would have liked to have, like, known a little bit of what was going on there, but that's only, like, a part of the, huh? One of the things that are, do you want to know one of the things that are suggested in Chapter 1? But oh, well, no, I'm just, no. I, uh, no, yeah. I'm, 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 well, it's a Moa doesn't, like it. Moa doesn't like spoilers for Chapter I skip yeah, the no. story. No, I just I just like to just I, yeah. when I, I like to usually just see them and when I when I get there when I read them out I'll, I'll find okay. out when I get it when I actually read it. Okay. Um, that is fair. Yeah. Right? Do you think it's going to be something that's going to pop up in one of the later chapters? What? Well, the thing I was going to tell Momo. I don't. I don't know. I, I was paying attention. We, we don't know what you're going to tell Momo. Yeah. <laughs> That's, DM me yeah, it, Jerry. DM me it. Okay, yeah, DM, I'll DM, DM it. You. So that was very entertaining. Um, the it was a lot of fun, though. Yeah, yeah the, the editing streams uh, at that point had me uh, basically reworking it. And when we go back to edit Chapter 2 again, I'm thinking we're going to probably want to go back over what I wrote and have Bright add in a few more things of her own because a lot of it is basically just exactly what I wrote verbatim. Yeah. And then uh basically the other thing I wanted to mention just like the the sheer like probably one of the funniest anecdotes I've gotten from these streams comes from when we started trying to have bright like think of our own stuff to edit and write in. At one point it came to that part where uh bright stood up in the VCR room, right? From the chair. Yeah. Initially, the descriptor before Bright started yelling was just something to the tune of uh, Bright immediately got out of the chair. And Jiri and I are like, okay, you know what? This could use a bit more description. What's Bright doing with her body? What's What else is going yeah. on? Yeah. So, like, we, we say that. I stopped paying attention for, like, five minutes playing a racing game. And Bright mentions, okay, done. I look back, and in the intervening time, Bright has... All of a sudden, added, Bright leaps out of the chair and throws the chair against the wall. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty rad. And if she was going to do that, I also think like there should be something like she's like fighting against the guards <laughs> at the very least and not just letting them put her in the chair because that was kind of the, the, uh, the, the, that was the, the the image that I got is she got the, she got out she threw that fucking chair and then like the guards came and she basically complied and I was like well she well, why wouldn't she fight back <laughs> yeah, kind of thing, but yeah we should we should have thought of that so maybe next time we do editing we can add that in and then next story stream when we have Momo back we can have Momo reread that section yeah maybe the, yeah chapter one and I, like I said I would also like to see like the 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 the, the transition of getting too laughy i think should be a little bit more clean especially with the vhs and stuff yeah um i think like you should actually like um describe what's going on and what bright's seeing and then like go into the transition of her being in the show with the, with the guy um yeah yeah that's probably a good idea we can definitely work on it just call this the second to last draft of the recording then yeah. Yeah, I don't have to edit shit. There was you don't have to edit too much. Yeah. I think everybody did a good job voice acting, though. I'm sorry. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Good job all around, oh. people. Uh, what were you trying I to say, Ryan? Uh, yeah, because... Ryan, you was about to say something. Pretty much. 
Yeah, you can go ahead and say it, Jerry. I'm not. Wait, well, wait, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before, before that, before that happens, before you say that, uh, Doc, um, Rianne had something to say. Oh. There was one moment about halfway through near the end of the third page, um, where I felt like it moved scenes a little too fast. I can't remember what part specifically, but if I had it in front of me, I'd be able to point it out. But um, it felt like it transitioned a little too fast, like you could have lingered a bit more, described a little more. I'm That's fair. Guessing, I'm guessing you're meaning the section where uh, they're going from where Mayuro Shinek sent the character speaking to the Bell Pepper Tree Room. Um, Not Bell but the Pepper Tree Room. It's not a Bell Pepper. Yeah, I... <laughs> bell pepper. Was like, bell peppers are fucking. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. I'm streaming it, man. Yeah, I'm looking. I really ought to write this stuff down when I think of it instead of like That's a good mentally sense. filing it away for later. That's probably a good idea. Has anyone been taking notes? I haven't been taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly more this is just my my opinion of things. Um my steel trap ass brain just kind of yeah, I so... keep Can I say some one track thing? of some of it? Can I say one thing for my yelling parts? My dog got off the bed, came to look at me, and got a look of concern. Aww. <laughs> That's because he wasn't sure if he, what was about to happen. <laughs> like, what's going on? Mama! Mama! He's back in the bed, sleeping. Didn't mean to make uh, you cry. <laughs> if I'm not back again this time, tomorrow. Carry <laughs> on, carry on. As, nothing nothing really matters. Matters. Anyway, uh, Jerry was saying he wanted to say something to you, Momo. Technically, actually, I just wanted to say it in gen general. Technically, we did skip a lot in that chapter since technically to get to the tree, it was a lot of walking, but it wasn't described. And let's be honest. To get that deep, they probably took an ele they probably walked, then took an elevator, then walked more. Yeah, then we should sure. probably just go about explaining that a bit more. Yeah, and explain what Bright sees along the way, because this is the SCP Foundation, and yeah. this is basically she's in a new body. And I would like imagine that, like, okay, like seeing some of the horrible shit that goes down, like at this place, would yeah. be probably screams like screams in the distance. Yeah, the screams in the distance. Um, motherfuckers getting ripped to shreds. <laughs> Um, or like people, you know, people losing their minds, mm, you know, no. sanity. W would they be walking the entire time without saying literally anything? True. Not yeah. necessarily, but like you, that's something, like I said, that's something that you would more want to expound upon, especially on bright end or even like in her mind, like, like, you know, yeah. thinking of you shit to say. Cool is if, um. You use that transition time to kind of highlight the dynamics between Dr. Radler and Dr. Bright. Um, like, it would if, be... if they talked a little bit more at the beginning and then the conversation during that transition could kind of show how deeply shaken Dr. Radler actually is and how he did actually care before. Dr. Bright is just annoying as fuck. Um. I don't think they would like show in like a drastic, they wouldn't be like weeping or crying. Or well, that's no, that's not what, um, oh. I don't think that's what Rihanna is saying. Kind of no. like, I'm talking about like a dialogue dynamics sort of thing. Uh. Well, you get to see these people actually be friends. And like and after Bright dies. And, yeah, well, in this know. case, it would be a one way dynamic friendship wise. It'd be one person totally suspicious, another one 
feeling very depressed and just trying to take that dialogue up and sipping their cold coffee that probably gone cold like hours ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, that's something you could describe, right? That's the beauty of writing is that yeah. even if there's nothing to say, saying that there's nothing to say, like you can turn that in of itself into a moment. So, yeah, you can even use that as a way to um, show. T- taking down notes that I will then send to Bright's DMs and pin uh, for later. Mm-hmm. So we've got expand upon, I said rattle, not rattler. <laughs> expand upon uh, rattler and Bright scenes. Make Bright fight more against guards at end. And describe contents of Laffy's tape more. Also, yeah. we notice, uh, I don't think the first scene between Bright and Rattler needs to be expanded upon, just the second scene. Yeah, I should probably add yeah. second, second. Hell, why not both? Yeah. If you go, like, <laughs> if you go, like, you know, even if, um, even if it is, like, a one-way type thing, you still, like, I find it impossible to believe, especially if, like, this dude was going to have help try to get her memories back in this new body. I, I find it kind of hard to believe that he wouldn't at least try to, like, have some, show some sort of a concern. Uh, for this, at least that's the portrayal that I got. I mean, Doctor um, Radler is is waiting in a chair right. outside the room with a cold with coffee. Co- coffee tired, yeah, worried. he's been right. there a while. So he's he been there cares. for a minute. So he gives a damn, and yeah. it's like, yeah. Also, uh, Jerry, there's one thing you tell Mama. Oh yeah, the thing that uh, Bright apparently thinks is like obviously written in the first chapter but i don't think it is it is that mm. go ahead basically bright doesn't have any bad memories that's why she never remembers her friend rattler well because she only remembers the bad things oh uh, Kara doesn't have bad memories of jerry uh not jerry jack rattler jack, yeah jack rattler I am not my character a reminder <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Yeah, that's been a pretty common thing. Both Bright and I occasionally accidentally mixing up uh, Jerry, our friend, and Dr. Rattler, the character. Yeah, it like it's confirmed like in Chapter 1 that there's no bad memories of Dr. Rattler. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add make clearer yeah. that only bad yeah. memories. You know what? Uh, although I think the first part of their interaction is long enough, you could add something like have uh, Radler add like an empanada or something on top of the paper file, like just remember to eat or something. Yeah. Some, yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, yeah add I, a bit more character. I thought of empanada, I was just thinking <laughs> snack food. And then I was that's like, the, that's, that's the word I was looking for. Snack food characterization i appreciate you saying that patch yeah um because yeah when when i think about it like with all the work we did in laffy it like it, it probably will be kind of jarring if like the first chapter features two prominent characters that aren't really superly expounded upon and then suddenly we have super charismatic laughing man uh, gleefully describing gore. Oh, wait, you know what? We should ask Bookworm if, if they noticed anything. That's a good idea. Yeah, they're here. <laughs> they're yeah. I wait. do need to go, like, within ten minutes or so. I just see Bookworm's message that, that, that says, yells and Jacksepticeye laugh. <laughs> yeah, that shit was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Bookworm is a funny dude. There is one episode that I won't choose be placed in, um, which is the squirrel one. Yeah. Does Momo know that episode? Well, it would. I was. I would assume. I mean, I. I've. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be like. I'm not asking for like. Understand, I'm not asking for like like yeah. like uh, splatterpunk, okay? <laughs> oh no, this I isn't just, uh, this isn't splatterpunk per se. No. 
I know, and I'm not. I'm not asking for that. I, I just got to <laughs> reading one of those books, and it was terrible. Yeah. Um, plus, uh, plus to clarify, Brad, I think it would be better if we expanded upon like what's implied in the second chapter, mm-hmm. where it's ah. like we should talk about the things that Bright would have seen Laffy's show displaying before Laffy later expounds why he was doing those things. Yeah. What is more also explaining why, some, what some of these is. SCP... Oh, sorry. Also explaining what some of these SCPs do. I know people who read, <laughs> who know what SCP is, will already probably know what these things do, but well, also like a description of what some of these things do at least at least we the scp 579 yeah. the character right. shouldn't explain it to each other but definitely the narrator <laughs> like yeah. in the narration the narration it should be like you know what does this scp do and but like and, and well you could you could do that um but like also for the second part it might be important to kind of shorten it until after bright eats the pepper because if bright's gonna eat the pepper then you explain what happens <laughs> after that can that and that'll make a little bit more sense better sorry i'll be right back i gotta use the restroom that's fine so hatcher we don't have to worry about 579 because we technically did describe that yeah that one's described as best as we can yeah because we're just like it's an anime we don't know shit (laughs) yeah that's actually true there's like nothing (laughs) it's just dead expunged oh there's actually one thing that is confirmed about the anomaly I meant to tell you guys, it's canon that any physical object gets in there, gets dematerialized, and comes non-existent. Mm. Oh. So pretty much... Wow, terrifying. So yeah, pretty much that D-class is dead. (laughs) Okay, so uh, Bookworm hasn't added anything he noticed, has he? No. They just said Splatterpunk. Is this Splatoon now? Lol. Yeah, Bookworm, do you have any notes? Yeah, because I, I do need to get going. Yeah. So I want to finish this up quick. Yeah. Let's see what they say. Silence. Oh, I'm just adding... Uh... I'm trying to add some snack suggestions for the end of their first interaction since I think it's long enough, but I think maybe handing them a snack around the near the end of their interaction could give a better sight of it. If it helps make you feel better, Jerry, my character eats a lot of junk food, but in chapter three it's described why that wouldn't really affect her in the body she's in now well yeah but before it definitely would have affected her uh so no no words from book uh book says i don't know i'm not good at noticing this type of stuff also there are times i had to lower volume stream so i could clip oh okay that's that's valid so yeah they don't have anything (laughs) all right then as of now my list for uh, I, mean, I I should probably actually title this message uh, Things to do in chapter one. We can probably finish all that in one stream, though. Likely, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. We can probably have, like, one more stream looking at chapter one and then Boom. probably move on from there. Then we can set up a date where Moa can join us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, on that list, I have Describe SCPs Better for Normie Losers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, expand uh, expand upon second Rattler and Bright scenes. I think I'll just take away second and say expand upon Rattler and Bright scenes since it seems like we're pretty hard in on editing both areas. Uh, make clearer only bad memories were returned. Uh, make Bright fight more against the guards at the end and describe contents of Laffy's tape more. Those are the five. Those are the five I've got. Any mm-hmm. any more to add or? Nope. I think we're all good. Okay then. I will send that. I will. What the fuck is the pin? There we go. 
I also have right. to like reread right. Laffy's tapes to see how it would the tapes would usually play out. Yeah, true. That's a good idea. And when it comes to it, I kind of want to voice Laffy, unless you want to go about that. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's fine. I've been giving him like a, like at first a show host voice, then it, of course, then it switches yeah. to a normal sadistic like voice. Yeah, yeah. Either so way. Um... I mean, if you're up to do that, I, I'm fine with that. I don't mind. Yeah. I, I feel like I could have a lot of fun with that role. Right. As many bloopers as there will be. Yeah, that's There will be a lot. Anyway, um, yeah, I gotta go. So, uh, have a good night, everyone. Hope the other stories are sufficiently spooky and or enjoyable or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Take care. Good talking with y'all. Yeah. Later. Later. Now yeah. When, yeah, now when Momo Mo gets back, uh, Jiri, you said you wanted to read your story? Yeah, in a moment, though, because I still want to finish uh, making this snack list suggestion. Ah, that's fair. Well, we have to wait for Momo anyway. Should I read my history essay in the meantime? I mean, if you want to. <laughs> Let's see how long Microsoft Word takes to load. <laughs> mine load is instantly. Yeah, uh, mine always takes like a full minute. You want to know? Oh, sorry. I think it's. I think what's wrong with it is that it's a Mac. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Also. You know what I find funny? All right. Bands that cost like a hundred and fifty dollars cheap, uh, cheaper. Uh, oh, for fuck's sake! Ah, uh, bands that cost one hundred and fifty dollars cheaper than the ones that my computer came with keep my co computer cooler eighty percent more effectively than the more expensive one. The only reason uh, the more expensive one are more expensive because they have lights. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when I went oh, to... Word loaded. Yeah. Okay. So this is my history essay, and I'm sharing it. I'm probably not going to get very far in it because it's 28 pages for no reason. Jesus. It was supposed to be 15, but I got a little um, invested. I can tell. Hmm. It's called Shifting Social Paradigms, Special Education and Disability History. By the way, if anyone plagiarizes this, you're gonna get caught. I've already submitted it, so there's proof that I did it first, so just don't try. Uh, oh, so uh, one thing I should say as your yeah. lawyer, <laughs> where, where, where you, try, you will be you sued if you copy this. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're trying to copy it for school, you're probably going to get kicked out if it's a college. Oh, yeah. Big they time. don't take that thing sit, sitting down. They no. They do not. There's a reason every single class syllabus tells you not to plagiarize. Wait, did I ever tell you the time where someone plagiarized something extremely stupid in my art class? Really? Yeah. Tell me more. And this, when I was in college for a very short time, someone plagiarized someone else's thing of the of the circle bouncing. I kid you not, someone no. like oh. <laughs> that That's is so gosh. easy by now. No, dude, if you have to plagiarize like the first assignment in this semester, drop the class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. Yeah, but anyway, go ahead. Anyway, special education and disability history. I open with a quote from Judith Heman from 2017 during a TEDx talk, which reads, I didn't actually get to go to school in a real building until I was nine years old. 
And then I was in classes with only disabled children in a school that had mainly non-disabled children. And in my classes, there were students up to the age of 21. And then after the age of 21, they went to something called sheltered workshops with menial work and earning either nothing or below minimum wage. That was her quote. Special education is a generally known and unchallenged concept within modern society, with the layman understanding it as where the disabled kids go within the context of public education. Not much is thought of the field outside of those directly involved in it. Its history, while well documented by dedicated historians, archivists, and activists, oft goes ignored, except to mention how it has been weaponized against other minorities. For example, in the 1964 Schwab report, which spanned an academic year to investigate the prevalence and impact of racial disparities in the schools of Portland, Oregon, researchers found that the special education programs were disproportionately composed of African American students. This caused significant concern over the distinct and likely possibility that African American students were being designated as disabled, not for their academic needs, but for their race. Being placed within the special education setting when one does not require that type of support is already detrimental to student learning. As we will see later in this paper, add the subpar quality of this education from that time period on top of that, and you have a student who has been failed by their administration. While this is a deplorable practice and important to acknowledge in both history and modern times, attention given to it fails to genuinely consider the role and importance of special education in American history on a meaningful level. Make no mistake, despite this general lack of attention, special education has an intense history intrinsically tied to disability history and the disability rights movement spanning to the 1960s through the 1990s, which produced several pieces of landmark, landmark legislation cementing the rights of disabled people and challenged the way our society treated us. I argue that that the development of special education as we know it today directly parallels and reflects the ever fluctuating views of the disabled within our society over time, and that disability history is inseparable from these two phenomena. For the purposes of this paper, special education refers to the practices that include a segregated classroom specifically for students labeled as disabled with the idea that a separate environment from mainstream schooling would enable educators to better meet students' needs and for students to learn better. Special education also includes education, strategy, th th education strategies and materials built for and aimed at disabled people, whether at home, in mainstream classes, or in specialized settings. Disabled people refers to those said to have intellectual learning and severe physical or sensory disabilities during a time being discussed. This definition acknowledges and includes non-white students who were seen to be disabled at the time because of racial and ethnic bias and the social compulsion to uphold power dynamics, such as the previously mentioned students of Portland in the 1960s. Disability in this paper is treated as a social construct and a social class due to the shifting definitions over time. Within this definition, I maintain disability is not an inherently fully negative thing, but that does not erase the way its stigma has been weaponized throughout history. There are many ways to be disabled, but this paper focuses on only a fraction of these people. There is much more to say on the topic with various other types of disabilities, which will be left for another paper. This paper also will also contain outdated terms used for disabled people for the sake of referencing sources and older legislation with clarity. These terms include and are not limited to, I say them in the paper, but I'm not saying them out loud. <laughs> they each have their own nuanced definitions within the context of their time, but all the reader needs to know is that they are referring to disabled people with primarily intellectual and learning disabilities, such as autism, Down syndrome, or attention deficit, deficit hyper, hyperactivity disorder, more commonly known by its acronym, ADHD. These terms should not be used within a modern context and unnecessary usage of them will be avoided out of respect for those negatively impacted by their usage. Next section. I'm just gonna keep going till someone tells me to stop, so if you're ready, just tell me to stop. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Oh, okay, I'm gonna stop. <laughs>
oh. Right. <laughs> Jerry, did you want to do your story in the meantime, or are you waiting for Momo? Should I wait for Momo? Oh, that's that's true. I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea if they want to wait, if they want to listen to it, so uh, I'll wait. More essay. <laughs> Before the 1800s and through the first half of the 1900s, there was little to no legal basis for the education of disabled children, much less on a federal level. This did not mean that no such education was happening, Besides assuming parents who kept their disabled children at home would ensure the children would learn enough to function, there were institutions established specifically for disabled students in the early 1800s that they could be sent to live and learn in. One of the first of these was established with the assistance of Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, a Christian minister, Christian minister teacher, and principal of multiple schools. In, in 1817 in Hartford, Connecticut. This was the Connecticut Asylum for the Education and Instruction of Deaf and Dumb Persons, later known as the American Asylum and currently known as the American School for the Deaf, as it is still running today. The establishment of these first schools intended specifically for different types of disabled people was critical, as it provided both proof that disabled people could and should be educated and a foundation for a new era of institutional schools for the disabled. Gallaudet had high hopes for the school he helped found, as well as for the sensibilities in moral society. In a sermon he wrote and delivered to the audience at the opening of the Connecticut Asylum, he pleaded to the listeners for religious devotion, equating the mission to help educate deaf people to a mission in honor of the Christian God, and imploring them to imagine themselves in the positions of parents of deaf children. He was not alone in his mission, and it is clear he truly did care about the education of his students received, even if it involved a somewhat misplaced sense of pity. It is reasonable to conclude then, given the lasting success of the school for which the sermon was delivered, that there were and that there were ah shit, I'm gonna get marked down for that. <sighs> that there was fuck. I reread this like twelve times. God that there were a significant amount of people within early American society with an invested interest in the education of disabled children, regardless of their reasoning on why. Common schools, the functional predecessor of American public schools, rarely accepted disabled students, but they did accept them in certain forms. For example, in 1867, a school in Boston, Massachusetts established a segregated day class for deaf children. Many more classes were similarly formed in other locations for, and for other types of disabled students afterwards. However, despite the, despite the good intentions and the progress made by people like Gallaudet, disabled students still faced tremendous obstacles in obtaining a fair education and membership within their surrounding community. For one, it was still common to keep children at home or to send them to hospitals or asylums focused not only on education, but on treatment of their disability. Treatment in of itself is not a bad thing, but the goal of such institutions was to fix or protect disabled people from the rest of society, and spending one's whole life in such a way would be a miserable experience for anyone. Because of this, freedom of social movement was limited. Further, disability was considered an unsightly thing that should be removed. The ugly laws were some of the major proof and results of this point of view. The Ugly Laws is the name of a series of city ordinances established across the country that had similar objectives in outlawing unattractive beggars in public spaces, the first of which was established in 1867 in San Francisco, California, and the last of which was repealed only in 1973 in Chicago, Illinois. Because the laws targeted beggars and those who appeared to live in poverty, po poverty, poverty, they included disabled people, survivors of war or workplace injuries, immigrants, and homeless people, among others. 
Disabled students were not a welcome population because unless they could prove their economic economic worth, they were seen as a symbol of misfortune. Disabled people also faced the belief that they were staying on a genetic purity of the human race. Beginning around the 1890s, popular culture overran pushback from accredited scientists, and the eugenics movement took shape in the United States. <clears throat> eugenics is a bastardization of Charles Darwin's theories of theory of evolution, anchored in the idea that humanity's woes addiction, criminality, immoral behavior, disability, hysteria, and so on and so forth, can all be credited to the prevalence and inheritance of negative genes, and that humanity will benefit from only passing on the most culturally favorable genes. Political policies and social mindsets were adopted in the spirit of eugenics, contributing to widespread forced sterilization, stringent immigration laws, and involuntary institutions institutionalization for many social out outcasts and minorities, the disabled included. Eugenics is not a true science, but in the early 1900s, it spread its roots through the U.S. so thoroughly that in it inspired Adolf Hitler, leader of the fascist German Nazi party of the mid-1900s and the man responsible for initiating the genocide of millions of Jewish Europeans in the Holocaust. More than just general societal rejection, in the minds of eugenicists, disabled people were pests to be controlled and eliminated for the good of humanity. In 1923, Backwards and Defective Children, written by Pierce Bailey, an American neurologist, is published. The booklet advocates for the special training of disabled children, commenting on reportedly common sentiments towards disabled people reminiscent of eugenic ideology, such as, we ought to kill them all off. He reported this as astonishing because, according to the author, all of the intellectually disabled are essentially children, and most people are energetic about supporting children. Shortly after, The Education of Handicapped Children, written by psychologist John Edward Wallace Wellen, is published in 1924. This book also advocates for the education of disabled children, but is much more upfront about its negative bias towards these children despite his acknowledgement of these biases, and it emphasizes heavily with schools and teachers who must deal with the mandatory attendance of so-called problem children and disabled children. In both books, mentally disabled people are considered social menaces, further proving that disabled people were regarded as a threat to be tamed in the best of cases, rather than equally human and deserve inherently deserving of patience and respect. <coughs> Next section. It's moment. Yeah, I'm back. back. I, I returned. Sorry. Well, okay, cool. uh, I just yeah yeah I so just Jerry. returned to say that uh yeah Jerry likes twinks. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Jerry likes twinks very very much. I'm so glad Spoon's not in this room. Okay, oh Jerry. God. What I sent Momo is if you are back, say in VC how gay Jerry is. I saw that shit on the phone. I was like happily, <laughs> but of course, of course I'm gonna do that. Anything I was reading you say, my boss. Essay while we waited, it was sounding pretty good. I was like, ooh, yeah. Bookworm <laughs> also, pretty, I was like, ooh, Bookworm pretty good. also said, very nice essay so far. Yeah, Thank you. It's a very nice essay. So yeah. on it. And very I'm mad well. at myself that I didn't catch those grammatical mistakes before turning it in, but whatever. Yeah. Also, yeah, this is pretty good. Jerry was wondering if you would like to hear their story that, about their character's past. Uh, past. Backstory for Dr. Rattler? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's why uh, I didn't think you were interested, but uh, uh, Bright had me realize that you might be interested, so I should hold on until... Yeah. I was like, why wouldn't I be interested? <laughs> also, would anyone like to read the parts with the crazy old woman that is Radler's mom? <laughs> <laughs> We'll have in the story section the link to where the lines are that are in Spanish are translated. How so old and that. crazy is is Doctor Rattler's mom? Well, it's she. Is it like senility, or is it just? 
Well, she only looks old because all the stories of like the of the Mexican witches that I could find, I forgot what they're called. Bruja? Uh, yeah, like the Bruja. Brujas? The only uh like stories I could find on them like that were considered actual accounts were of old women. One which I found hilarious was specifically an old woman who turned one man into a woman and basically broke the other guy's dick. She got hormones? <laughs> she got the horo horo no me? She she turned she emporio one guy into a that motherfucker and, her, and basically made the other one so he couldn't get a hard hard on ever again. That is so <laughs> they must have transgendered. It, it transpilled the shit out of these fucking dudes. <laughs> I thought it was I love it. I just kept thinking, what did those men do to piss her off? Yeah, that's part of my question. I'm like, what series of events occurred where you make a witch that upset also, to change your entire fucking gender? The thing I found about a booha was they could change uh, shapes into different animals and things, but uh, they have to keep their human eyes uh, somewhere safe otherwise if it's destroyed then they can't put then they just keep those animal or other weird eyes in their face at all times like a sulky suit kind of like if they were a cat and they came back and their human eyes were gone then they'd basically be a human with cat eyes or if they were a lizard and they came back and their human eyes were gone they'd have like lizard eyes and stuff oh that okay, is that'd fucking be cool. crazy yeah that's okay. pretty rad that, that's well, not yeah, that's but, not that bad of a loss. What if he came back with shrimp eyes? Like the forbidden like, shrimp colors. The forbidden. These crazy animal eyes in ancient Mexico. You come around, you have llama eyes. Or like goat eyes, like they're they're off to the side and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also. Uh, Moon, while you're reading your your es essay, I was listening care very well and everything, but I was also going through files and whatnot and deleting shit. I had, uh -huh. in one of my storage areas, it was at 35 gigabytes left of storage. Um, can you please just, I, there were so many files that didn't need to be there that were there. Can you guys just look at that picture? I set in stream planning. I didn't even count how many files I deleted. I was just like, yeah, that doesn't belong. That doesn't belong. That's belong. God. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> God. Ow. From 35 to 222 gigabytes free. <laughs> it was mainly because it was like saving old videos that have already been published on the computer. Oh. Even though I deleted them. Dog. Oh, God. So that's why it was staying there. God, man, that's that it. is so much file space. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel physically pained looking at that. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I give an offer for someone to read the Psycho Mom if they would so want to. I'll read myself for you if you like. I can be Psycho. All right, Moon will be the mom. I, I also know how to pronounce Spanish, so if you want me to read in Spanish, I can do that. Yes, <laughs> her lines are entirely in Spanish. I have... And now, <laughs> <laughs> and Mo is just dying over here. <laughs> all her so all her lines are in Spanish, like completely. Yes. She probably knows English, but she's not going to speak English. I don't know why. I think it's because she feels very uh, bitter with Radler at that moment. And uh, she feels like uh, if it makes sense that uh, him speaking English was just part of one of the many like signs that he's distanced her himself from her. Yeah, I'm red, right? Yeah, you're red. Okay. <laughs> I am a huge fan of using um, language as a way to convey like deeper meanings, like using 
particular languages for a purpose, you know. Oh. So that that slaps. Also, uh, I did while I did my best to write the Spanish parts, and despite being like at least a, being like a quarter Spanish, I actually don't know any Spanish. I've taken multiple Spanish classes. I've done my best. This is as close as I'm ever getting. I did my best. So if you that if is you fair, like, huh? That is fair. So if you have any like suggestions on how it is wrong and why it sucks, then I am totally for that. I know what puta means. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh. Do you really? <laughs> oh, do you really know? And, and to clarify, yeah. I I said that I know how to pronounce Spanish, and not necessarily that I know how to. Like, I'm, not that I'm fluent in Spanish, because I'm sure, yeah. not, also, but I know how to pronounce Spanish, because, um, oddly enough, it, it clicked for me. I, I don't know why. I think it's from, like, growing up with trying to figure out how to pronounce Latvian things. That's um, fair. Yeah. Also, oh, okay, but what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Right? Neither of those, neither of the characters in the story would be the type to say that. Puta! <laughs> oh, did, I don't know what language it is, but apparently puta also means pig in another language. I forgot what language it was, but I learned about it and I was like, oh. <laughs> So you can either be calling someone a pig or an actual meeting. <laughs> well, different different uh, languages have different meanings. Yeah. Which means which means if I go to an animal farm, I can just scream puta if I see pigs. <laughs> I I if you go to a, 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 a Spanish pig farm, probably not. <laughs> if I go to a Spanish pig farm, you still. yell, bitch. People <laughs> look at me like, what the fuck? I was like, what the? What is this? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Anyway, Cherry, go ahead and read your story because I know you're excited to read it. All right. And thank you, Bright, for being willing to read the Bright Gosh, I, gotta, I gotta leave, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna head out. But I'm oh. going to listen on Twitch. Oh, okay. So. Oh, you're gonna listen on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm gonna listen yeah. on Twitch. See you, Momo. Yep. Have a good whatever you're gonna do. I'll take care. Let's go work out with a friend. I, I gotta head out, right. too. That's Aww. Because, that, that's because my... <clears throat> my Bradley, I love you. Bright, Bright I love you. <laughs> Dern, I love you. Rihanna, I love you. I'll yeah. take care. I'll be yes. too, Momo. Yeah, see you, Momo and Adorna. Bye, Momo and Adorna. See ya. Love you all. See ya. All right, now, since Momo's not here, we can talk uh, as much love towards them as possible and how we adore them as a god. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> your creepy little weird Momo cult thing. Let's get to the story. Log. Zero one redacted. Two redacted. First off, I would like to wish the asshole who suggested I need therapy a very happy new year. I'm a hard worker that enjoys working and there are no issues with that. I have been a number there have been a number of fellow staff members have taken more time off for health reasons. As a medical professional, I have often one of the doctors that noticed when someone needs to take time off for health reasons. Shouldn't I be the first to notice if I need any time off? My work hasn't been negatively affected that much by me not requesting nor wanting any large breaks from work of any sorts. There are no reasons for me to ever request time off for personal reasons, but that's not a bad thing. There are no traumas hidden in me. I may have grown up unusually, but I have, but I became a productive member of the foundation. When a staff member becomes injured internally or externally, I am quite good at figuring that out. Finding the issue, performing the treatment, 
The recent incident where I lost consciousness due to forgetting to rest was quite a mi was quite minor due to it taking place within the facility. I had also just finished examining that sample, taking notes, and putting everything away anyway, as if I could ever leave any of my work unfinished. As it occurred at the facility, no normal citizen saw the transformation occur. Ignore what my what I might have said in my sleep, dreams aren't meant to make sense or mean anything. Not entirely sure how to improve my work enough that my mental wellness won't be questioned. I know I was informed that it wasn't connected to my quality of work, but it feels that way. I recall one time I had worked so many hours I hadn't even noticed I had brought I had bought a can of soda coffee at a convenience store until I was busy working away at my desk. Why was that even a thing one can purchase at a normal store? I took a few moments to calm myself before writing more down. I've just realized my lack of socialization outside of work might look problematic. The fact that I place so, pay so little attention to the changes in the world that don't pertain to health and medicine does make me look out of touch with the world. I was one of the last people at work to find out about the existence of coffee soda that isn't being made by an anomaly of any kind. This isn't due to a lack of wanting to socialize, it's just hard for me. To myself, helping humanity is so vital that things unrelated to this goal usually fizzle from my memories. My father may have been human, but my mother never was. She was an anomaly sentient tree of unknown origins and abilities. I've been quite open about my parentage with higher-ups and let them decide who I'm permitted to tell. In my firm opinion, I do not believe it is out of paranoia or trauma that it feels as though my birth mother is watching from a distance while I am outside of the facility during that, not the night hours. My life tree being alive and locked away prevents my mind from being tampered with by people who cannot access it. So these cannot be hallucinations. The sensation does not leave me even when I'm in my apartment with windows all closed and every possible entry is properly locked. I even purchased some extra locks. Admittedly, this makes opening the door a bit more troublesome. Taking a few more minutes to open is worth that added protection. I'm sure the organization can appreciate the want for extra security. This is an understandable fear, not a paranoid fantasy. I don't know how a tree could walk around, but she had enough secrets. I'm sure one of them could involve walking around. Log, zero one, redacted. Two redacted. First off, happy National Bubble Bath Day. I've been informed of the, I've been informed that there are no there is no evidence that I'm being followed, but multiple examples of my high stress levels were presented to me. It has been uh, affecting my work, and thus needs to be treated. That's why I have to see a therapist now. That is why I have to write these logs. This suggested that I verbalize conversations with coworkers more outside of scolding them or otherwise gain, gaining avoidable illnesses and slash or injuries. I do, in fact, verbalize conversations. It's not like I ignore people that speak to me. It would be nice if Aaron was still part of the foundation or at least in containment. Their energetic attitude made me feel a bit less tired when days felt especially long. The years have made a few faces come and go, but their exit from my life hasn't been expected. I'm not a typical researcher, but a medical doctor. The only SCPs I have any direct involvement in researching were not the sorts with pulses. There were times I even bought drinks for her 
specifically before coming in for my shift. I thought I saw a woman with my exact skin tone near the coffee shop I was in after work. She had wild looking wavy hair that was black and gray, well-aged dark gray eyes that seemed to stare with an intensity, a well-aged form that stood firmly. She never walked into the building, but my memory firmly places her as staring at me while I was inside. I don't know why none of the cameras could pick up her form, but my eyes witnessed her existence. Machines can be tampered with in a number of ways anyway, and my vision is only affected by my... She was there and existed. Encounter may have been waved off by my therapist. Listed reasons. My mother... My mother was a tree. She was not a human. She was last spotted in Mexico where my... Where she was last spotted at, in Mexico while this facility is located in the United States. But she wasn't in Mexico when she slept with my father either. I don't think any version of him ever went to that country at any point. Yes, neither me nor him have spoken previously. What would I even say? One of the versions of you somewhere bedded a tree and had a child leaving the cave that is the tree's home brought me to a different timeline and reality than the virgin that slept with her? I'm scared a tree might be following me? That it was likely angry that I hadn't been completely obedient? It wouldn't be right to push that onto my blood father, not any version of him. What do you think? Why do you think I haven't changed my last name to his? Trying to claim his family as my own would be a selfish burden to them, even if they are the family. I chose to follow in the footsteps of. Choosing to be human instead of becoming like her is probably the reason she's angry. There's a reason I think this. My hair was once connected to her tree like an made of plant fibers. She would tell me what to do every day, but I questioned everything as soon as I could speak. There were things I refused to eat or do, just as there were some questions she refused to answer. The cord detached once I hit puberty, and all I could think of was leaving her cave. She always told me that I couldn't return if I left, and she was right. From there on, I ignored any and all possible pleasures in life in order to achieve my goal in becoming the best doctor I could. A college scholarship brought me to America, working so hard that I would sometimes lose all energy and fall into a fever. During those times, I had dormed. Uh, I had my dorm room locked, waiting in a bed, stuck in my indigo blue rattlesnake form until the fever broke. The only person I told any of this to was Dr. Erin Bright. She was family as well as a friend, even if she didn't know the first part. Obviously, this means I told her everything, but my father was. Maybe if I had told her, I would know how we are related. It doesn't matter, because what ifs doesn't change the past. At the time, she was eating a deep dish pizza with various toppings stuffed inside it, some sparkling water to wash it down with. My own food was a pile of masa empanadas stuffed with potato, tomato, onion, garlic, cilantro, soy, chorizo, and queso, and anejo. Equally unhealthy was a well-sized side of Chicharrones, the harina, coated in chili pattern lime. There was a side of pinto beans with queso con on top being used to dip for anything else with me. Just thinking about it was troubling at the time. Horrifying images had flooded my nightmares. The pizza was a tall, thick bribe to not feel guilty for talking about it in some way. Maybe I told her too much, but neither of us were clocked in at the time, and she had a certainly noticed the weight of those memories building up. I dismissed it so many times who asked before her over the years, yet the same couldn't be done with her. I told her of the nightmare I was having, and it I was a child still connected to the tree. 
corpses of men would hang from her vines that wrapped around the bodies. She would demand I feed on them, but I would shake my head. The bodies would then shrivel until the skulls were still hanging on the trees, other bones turning to dust. I had finished eating the, a bite of pizza a, a bit faster than I expect, expected before speaking up. There's a lot of things I've seen and read while well, part of Foundation. That includes that people sometimes deal with trauma. That sounds like trauma. You aren't a psycho bitch, human eating tree, witch thing like her. Humans are built to eat. Humans aren't built to eat other humans. I looked at her, eyeing how she was eating a bit. Shouldn't you be using a fork, right? That looks a bit thick for pizza to just not use one. She waved her hand, dismissing my concerns before. She positioned her plate and picked up the slice of pizza. Before, she had just been eating it a bit weird. Now it felt like she was definitely purposely consuming the thick deep dish pizza that way on purpose. It was like trying to get her to eat properly got her to eat more chaotically instead. Well, you are right. Humans evolved specifically not to eat other humans. This is why cannibalism is rare in the among humans outside of specific SCPs. I'm not sure I would call her all those things, though. All those things, though. I picked up one of the empanadas, stuffing it in my mouth. There was no fork in my hand. But this was actually a food that was supposed that. But this was actually a food you were supposed to be eating using your hands anyway. Oh, well, think about it. Aaron put the pizza back down on the, its plate. She didn't like you asking things. Didn't want you to leave the cave. Didn't like you not listening. Those plants growing in the cave sounds anomalous in in itself. Did she ever hear voices from them? Anything like that? She took a swig of the sparkling water before going at her food again. A spoon was stuffed with beans, queso, and corn as I raked through the, my brain to answer. The question had thrown me off a bit. Felt a bit off topic at the time. Thought I heard them whispering a lot while I was growing up, but moving it bit at time when I thought they were. I thought I heard them whispering a lot while I was growing up, or moving bits at the time when they thought I wasn't looking. I think I was just imagining things out of loneliness. She always said I was imagining things. That's called gaslighting. I think you would have become a plant like them if you did everything she told you. Also, I'll eat the pizza hour the hell I want. Aaron stared right at me, shoving more pizza in her mouth. Certainly was a messy affair, but at least it seemed like she was enjoying it. Wouldn't have been a good bribe to bite her pizza if she wasn't like if she didn't like it. I shoveled some of the beans, queso, and corn in my mouth. This was repeated a few times. Each time it seemed my mouth would be soon free to speak. Hey, uh, Indigo, are you all right? I finished the bite I was on, drowning some water after. Sorry, yes, I'll be fine. Just a lot to think about. I don't want to imagine you being right, because it'll mean so many terrible things. You have all the time in the world to mull over everything to tell you ready to think about that stuff. What's she gonna do? Hunt you down all the way from Mexico? Another empanada was gently grasped by one of my hands. The woman in Mexico, when my blood with her to avoid getting killed. Who's her dad? My indigo blue eyes watched her as she started shoveling the pizza in her mouth again. He was pale like her, but with different eyes and his hair and hair color than she had. It was my chance to come clean to find out how we're related. But I was worried. If I even if I was even allowed to say at the time, a member of the foundation, I'll tell you more one day if I get approved to share the information with you. I I had asked for approval out of this after our conversation. 
I'd asked for approval of this after our conversation. My request was denied. I didn't understand why, but in retrospect, I wish I said something before I knew it would be approved of. But I was a coward that was and is desperate to follow all the rules to a T. This old conversation had been ringing in my memory more. Sometimes I wonder if she was right. That would be horrifying. She had been my only real friend, even if people at she had been my only real friend, even if people at work, even my neighbor have neighbors have been even if people at even if people at work or and even my neighbors have always found me as a quiet and nice person, others have a hard time disliking. I have a long history of not making friends. Years of tireless work, barely eating, got me through every year of college as well as residency. A dizzying fever that hit me particular after a particularly long night shift at the ER caused my body to transform into rattlesnake in a public setting. This is how the foundation found me. I handed the seed that held my life in it to the foundation. My life was placed in their hands. It grew into a strangely tall tree that grew indigo colored peppers from it. That shift became easier to control for the most part after the seed started to grow. But now I turn into a snake at night every full moon, changing back when the night ends. A lot of years have passed since joining the foundation. Technology has changed since then. My skills in medicine have grown as well. Fast food was born, air travel became normal, and the internet became commonplace. Phones are now an everyday thing and no longer a functionality. For my experience and skills to earn me level floor, floor clearance was an honor, unexpected by me. If I had learned anything over the years, it is to trust the actions of the five councils, even when their actions aren't completely understood by my person. Log 02, redacted, 2, redacted. Happy National Care Cake Day. Maybe I should try one one day. I had a dream last night, or rather a nightmare. I was a child again, back in the cave, up within blank, Mex back within at redacted Mexico. My mother was there as a tall tree, escaping humanoid at an upper half. The bright light from her hollow eye saw fed all the plants within the cave. Nothing there was outside of her sight and control. To dream, she would say that you don't want to be your father. To be human is to be weak. To be like her is to gain powers beyond humans. Her anger kept rising to the point where the light in her eyes changed from a pale yellow to orange and extremely red. Humans create things more amazing than will ever be in an attempt to feel less weak and worthless in the world. Abandon your dream to help humanity. If you don't, if you leave me, then I will hunt you down and take you back home and force obedience. My mind was haunted by the bodies and the even while showering in preparation to head for work. It had been the same hanging bodies from the dreams I'd told Aaron about when he was part of the foundation. There was more blood than this one, a faintness of life in them before she started draining their blood. I want to not die being in their last I want to not die being in their last sounds and movements, death rashes being included in this. I made what wash it it made washing my hair a bit hard. I know it cannot be cut without physically harming me, but it would bleed. There's no way to avoid washing it. But at one point it would also, I would, but at one point it would also, sorry, but at one point it was also what connected her to me. Maybe changing the hairstyle would help the feeling go away. What a braid simply makes it easier to avoid others coming in contact with it. Quickly made some burritos using chopped up veggies, black beans, black salsa with tomatillo, 
Lastly, some red and black corn. They were steamed, wrapped up. The most, though most were put away for later in the day. Each one was relatively small in size, but I only ate two of them for breakfast. It was hard to gain much of an appetite, and it was better than nothing. A cup of coffee with unrefined sugar, toasted tobacco, star meats made up in hopes of getting work calmly. Work was as expected as it comes to being in a work was as expected as it comes to being in a medical professional working at one of the facilities. Anything I've completed, researched, or treated needs to not be noted in a log concerning my mental well-being. About Aaron, there wasn't anyone I felt comfortable chatting with casually outside of scolding people for doing less than intelligent things caused by either injury or sickness. It was raining all day from morning hour I left home for work to the night hours that had me driving home. Felt the stare, though, most of the ride home, continuing as I reached my apartment. This has become normal at this point. I could hear someone trying to open the apartment entrance door at some point after dinner, but ignored it. It stopped after a few minutes, causing everything else to uh, everything else before bed to be rather uneventful. The sound of a loud knocking sound pulsed from my door and echoed through the apartment. It woke me at a rather late hour. This isn't something I recall neighbors or staff from the SEP Foundation ever doing in my years of living in this apartment complex. My phone was supposed to be my phone was supposed to sing a particularly agitating jingle when and if any one from work tried to contact me. It was as silent as one might expect at that time. It wasn't a sure thing if I should ignore it or call for help, so I opted to try to ignore the sounds. The minutes moved by slowly, the loud rapping against the door not allowed me any rest. There was an expectation that my neighbors would also be awoken didn't seem to be the case. It was then I started to suspect that this was my mother. Most people cannot make others run simply not hear them, but I am certain she would be capable of doing so. Just thinking about it, just thinking it might be her caused my heart to say, start racing. When I ignored the sound, but at this rate it wouldn't be able to fall back asleep, I continued to try to ignore it. I made an emergency call in bed to work before jumping into a pair of sweatpants. It was better safe than sorry, right? I was going crazy from stress. This would be proof. She was really outside my door, and maybe she could be captured and contained. My body trudged itself towards the door after the call, stopping a few feet away from it. My voice called out, sounding heavy with sleepiness that would want me to still lay in bed under the blanket. Who's out there? It was her voice telling me that it was her while calling me her precious son. I didn't want to open the door. Fear she might kill me for choosing to be human over being like her. Madre. I don't know why I was answering her. Eren las plantas mi hermanos. The female voice answered without pause. Eres especial mi indigo. What a terrifying answer. I couldn't help but to take a few steps back from the apartment's closed door. After a few quiet knocks wrapped against the door, what kind of answer was she hoping for? Just admitted. The plants in the cave were my were my siblings. The one said nothing any of the times I ate from them. She let me eat from them without even batting an eye. Even that night, outside my door, she didn't sound like she saw anything wrong with it.
he sees this come out it makes the meter go i sounded and felt more awake then how could i not with the ever rising fear within my heart that was painfully racing eres especial por no convert convertirte en una planta o un animal es por tu individual oh, jesus fuck individ individ it's okay you can sound there's it too out. many fucking syllables you know what you can sound it out in the first in the first read and then you can do after individualidad in individ i swear to god individualidad <laughs> just go with that dos hermanos no podrían llegar a ser como yo pero to see are you ready now i continued was that okay oh yeah i was just thinking since you got at i felt like reading it the first time would be the hard part it probably is <laughs> would you like to read again because you you do do her really really good all right Eres especial por no convertirte en una planta o un animal. Es por tu individualidad. Tus hermanos no podrían llegar a ser como yo, pero tú sí. The voice sounded as calm as ever, saying everything. Hearing it spoken in such plain language was terrifying. It was scary enough that she had already confirmed the plants that I had nibbled from each day I had lived with in the cave were all my his were all my, my siblings, but now she was trying to justify telling me it's nothing? Was this gaslighting? Or could she not comprehend human emotion? It was hard to tell exactly how it was classified when my mom and girl were trying to absorb this information. Déjame entrar para que pueda arreglar. Déjame entrar para que pueda arreglarte. ¿Has plan plantado tu semilla de vida? ¿Es donde está tu mente y tu humanidad? Si elimino esa humanidad, entonces puedes ser como yo. Por supuesto que quieres ser como yo even asked if I wanted to be fixed. Emily pleaded with me to let her fix me. Of course I didn't want any aggressive anomalous entity like her. The idea of letting her fix me sounded terrifying. My tree is already planted somewhere. See you can't. There was a scream. She started banging. There start she started banging Starting at the door. Traitor! Traitor! El existe la humanidad sobre la familia de ahora sufrir. Mi padre es humana. Sorry. Mi padre es humana. My father's Jack Bright was born human. Eligi mi familia humana. I shouldn't have responded so quickly, nor with so much emotion. She was yelling like I betrayed all my family, everything, everyone that mattered. There was no way for me to pick both sides. So she was now informed of which side I had chosen. The screaming and pounding against the door stopped. For some reason, that was more terrifying than the noise she had, the noise. For some reason, that was more terrifying than the noise had been. <laughs> Como una humana entonces. She spoke calmly. I could hear her footsteps walking away after her words ended. Some agents arrived not long after she left. Apparently something anomalous had left damage in my I was offered to stay at a temporary apartment somewhere else for safety. Things cleared. I was too tired and exhausted from fear to agree with that. People do stupid things when exhausted. I think it was stupid, but I declined. 
Setting, settling to make report before heading back in. Sleep took me as soon as I entered the bed, not even having time to put a bl the blanket over myself. I woke up in the morning feeling tired and exhausted, but we're cold. The cold of the shower couldn't help me wake up or calm down. At least it felt nice. I will update my journal after I get to work. Log zero three, redacted, two, redacted. Sorry, I can't recall any national holidays of the day. My mind is still a bit everywhere, but I'm getting better. The day work told me to get some sleep. I thought she was around to contact the foundation. I bought a hot cinnamon dulce de latte at a coffee shop on the way home to help ease my nerves anxiety frayed from the other night. I was in the doorway of my apartment hanging the keys up in the hook near the doorway. My back was facing the doorway when it happened. She could be she could be heard from before their roots had she could be heard before their roots had had a, she could be heard before she, their roots had a chance to strike. I only had time to feel a renewal of fear and drink my hot beverage. She was something between human form and tree form, but root, roots burrowing into the flesh and draining blood from the veins, muscles, and organ tissue, along with other bodily fluids. To say that was terrifying would be an understatement. Her roots were blocking my ability to move scream. Clearly, the plan to contact the Foundation, if I thought she was nearby, had failed. All that was in my view when losing consciousness was my mother's hollow tree eyes looking down at my bleeding form with contempt. My body regrew from my tree. It took around a week for my body to come back, but it wasn't until a month that my mentally well. But it wasn't until a month that I was mentally well enough to leave the foundation premises. I've been assured that the mess was cleaned up before anything could be leaked, since they had been expecting her to attack. <coughs> She evaded capture, so I have moved to a different apartment in a different building. I don't know when the Foundation will get her. The sooner the better, how she treated me, how she sees all humans, like food. End of story. Do you think uh, he meant to left to leave? Jury. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I realized I left the thing. Oh my god! <laughs> I was like, I, I, I was like, first I, I thought you genuinely meant to leave. Like, all right, that's my story, and then just gone. I think my brain did leave a little for the. <laughs> anyway, you did an amazing read of the Mom Moon. I did not know anyone could do that psycho so well, but you. Did <laughs> Yeah. My Spanish is rusty, holy, but uh, I had fun with that, so. Hey, I didn't do the best with Spanish either, and I'm a quarter Spanish. <laughs> I bookworms and clap, 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 up. Yay, clap, 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 clap. Yeah. So... so I am suddenly a lot more attached to this character than I was before. Yeah, you can say he has a history of an abusive parent. That definitely... Not just that, but just, like, getting to see the inside of his mind was like, oh, wow, this person's really relatable, actually. <laughs> well, he is, he is human, after all. He may be an anomalous human, but he is human. He has all these emotions and... He may be smart, but he made sacrifices to get where he was. He can yeah. be a little obsessive when he wants to do something. 
But also, I oh, especially liked the part um, where he is constantly irritated with his co-workers for being the dumbest motherfuckers in the facility. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, Jerry, does Dr. Rattler get uh, frustrated with me? <laughs> I don't think Rattler does. It didn't uh, sound like Aaron was the type to do those stupid things. She did fair. things, but not stupid things that would get her in horrible, horrible trouble, if that makes sense. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Bright only gets her, herself killed sometimes. Yeah. She only got herself killed that one time, and then for Radler, she basically vanished. As you can tell by the story. Yeah. This is basically between uh, chapter one and whatever chapter next uh, that Bright has Aaron pop back at the foundation. Yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah. Also, appar apparently Aaron was ro wrong about the mom never finding him. Like, what you gonna do? Track you all the way from Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> way to speak it into existence. Yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll bring, bring the flamethrower and the chainsaw. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do a flamethrower. That'll that'll hurt Doctor Radler, right? Because Doctor Radler is still part tree or whatever. Doctor Radler wouldn't be hurt because he's part tree, but because he's a person. People. Well, are... I mean that too, but like... people are slightly <laughs> allergic to being set on fire. No, we're talking about like harming your your mother. <laughs> no, that mother. wouldn't hurt him physically at all. In fact, if you want to, you can bring her in your story and, like, totally burn her out. Alright, I'll make sure to arm uh, 13 nukes on top of her. <laughs> I've got a skedaddle. Um, Alright. Right. Nice hanging out with y'all. Yeah. It was wonderful. You did an amazing move. Yeah. Hey, Thank Jerry. You. Yeah. Jerry, are you gonna stick around? Bye. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, I'm going to have you and Bookworm decide. Because I have one, two, three, four, five creepypasta stories I'm going to read before I end stream. Oh. Uh, thank you for following uh, Denji Kawasatoki. If I said that wrong, I am sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyway. I Yeah, you can vote too. Uh. I have when the bad kids where the where the bad kids go. Just ninja works as well. Okay, where the bad kids go? Containment, Hypno's Lullaby, Pokemon Black, and Curse of the Unknown King. The last three are Pokemon could be bosses. <laughs> yeah, because it was hard for me to find creepypastas that did, that didn't have uh grammar issues. That's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you have five. You know, I'm a, I'll do a poll. That way it makes it a lot easier. I'll be honest, after I vote, I'm probably going to rush to the bathroom. That's fine, I I'll wait for you. I'm a good person. <laughs> Are you saying I can run off to go pee? Well, I'm also going to set it for a long time. For like 10 minutes. So. Oh. Yeah, so if you need to go pee right now, you can. It'll probably still be up. <laughs> Alright, I'll be back. Alright. In three, two, one.
Yeah, I think the worst at Creepypasta I've ever seen was Sonic.exe. Holy fuck. The original. I mean, the, the new revised version ain't that better, but it's at least better than that one. Dear God. Like, the games are good, and the animations are good. It's just the story itself. Just, just, just why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was not that great. Not at all. So, far away, how, how is everyone? How is everyone in chat doing? Doing all right, trying to keep cats keep cats out of trouble. All right. I know how that feels. I have a little troublemaker on my bed right now. I have a little buster. Yeah, I was talking about you. <laughs> He's a he's a dog though. All right, let's see what shall I do? To pass the time. I shall just mess with the emotes I have for no apparent reason because I am not intelligent <laughs> and easily entertained. <laughs> Damn it, I exceeded the character limit. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Why am I this easily entertained? <laughs> Just by doing random bullshit. <laughs> I'm back. Because pretty emotes. <laughs> uh, the poll is still up, by the way. Uh, it's where the bad kids codes is in the lead by two votes. Containment is in second place with one vote. I'm yeah. loaded. I will be back. I'm gonna grab water very quick. Okay. <laughs> uh, three votes for the word back kids go. <laughs> I think I know where to, which story is gonna be read first. <laughs> which is kind of funny because that's the first one, so I can probably just read it in order from there. <laughs> Uh, and now we wait for the poll to end. Lolly, that's true. I probably should have said it for a le way less time. Okay. Welcome back, oh. Cheery. The poll is still up. <laughs> <laughs> I already voted. Well, there are additional votes if I think about it. I, I think it is. So it can probably go all the way to vote 600 votes. Oh, yep, there it goes. 
<laughs> it's definitely where the bad kids go. <laughs> yep. Oh, oh. <laughs> yep. It's definitely where the bad kids go. <laughs> so it's already winning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't mess with the pole. <laughs> I see that. Wait, who voted Pokemon Black? Huh? Someone else voted Pokemon Black. Huh. Voter fraud is real. <laughs> Wait, is Momo still in chat? Uh, voter fraud is fun. <laughs> Because Momo said they would be in chat to hear your story, Jerry. It's more like they said they'd listen to it while they were working out with a friend. If they're working out, they probably don't have any uh, free hands to type anything out. I see. So so they can hear me. Hey, Momo. Um, Do a really uh, good job. I believe in you. Oh, Push those okay. weights real hard. I got you. You oh, got this. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I'm such an idiotic friend who does the most insanely batshit bullshit things possible. Which is probably really bad because this is Ninji's first time ever going on the stream and they're hearing all this shit. <laughs> Welcome to my streams. Nothing ever makes sense. It's always chaotic. <laughs> Well, right, you're a wonderful person, but you're also chaotic. I feel yeah. like you said that to Momo specifically to mess with him while he's working out. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I hope he wasn't doing any heavy lifting when you said that shit. <laughs> There's going to be an angry message later from Momo saying, like, why the fuck he did this? <laughs> Oh uh, god, a pole's almost ending. <laughs> Wait, why is it now being tied between containment and where the bad kids go? It's almost tied. 169, the other 68. And Pokemon Black's also 68. What is happening? Oh, now it's, now it's tied. Oh wait, no. Pokemon Black is winning now. Just because. <laughs> Who's gonna win now? <laughs> I'll probably just read them in the order of the votes. So like once it before it like <laughs> yeah it looks like Pokemon Black's gonna win Jerry. I'm not surprised. It's at 249 votes, 252. I I also find it funny how Hypno's Lullaby didn't get a single vote. <laughs> Every other one's got votes. Hypno's Lullaby is too creepy. <laughs> oh my gosh, it is neck and neck. Neck and neck. Oh. Oh, Curse of the Unknown King's in the lead. Yeah, Curse of the Unknown King's gonna win now. <laughs> For sure. It's like a few seconds left. There's no way Pokemon Black's gonna get enough votes. Oh my gosh, 420. <laughs> really, Book? Okay. 
that's actually a better picture. All right. And with an amazing upset, our winner. All right. So the order, it will be Curse of the Unknown King, then Pokemon Black, then Where the Bad Kids Go, then Containment, then Hypnos Lullaby with two votes. <laughs> Alright, let's go to Curse of the Unknown King. Everyone ready? I think this was recently made. Yeah, I think this was only made like last year. Oh shit, no, it was made in February 2023. Damn. This what is, happened? This this story was made in February 2023. February 10th. This year? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Everyone ready? Alright, here we go. <clears throat> It would be around 11 o'clock at night on Christmas Eve. My parents were not at home and would not be back until the next day, as they were partying at my grandparents' house. Under normal circumstances, it would have been, I would have gone, but I was sick. So there I was, alone in my house, with a fever of 37 and a half, watching TV when suddenly my doorbell rang. I went to see who it was. I wasn't expecting any visitors, and I knew it would it couldn't be my parents, since my grandparents' town is an hour and a half away from where we live, and they had called me to let me know that they had arrived only a quarter of an hour ago. I looked through the peephole to see who it was, but no one was there. I assumed it was a drunken joker. You know, on Christmas Eve night, I opened the door to make him leave. But when I did, I found a package on the landing. Wow, it seemed that Santa Claus had come this early this year. I don't know who would have bitten, but at that time, he seemed like a pretty generous person. However, to my misfortune, my disappointment was not long in coming. I took the package home and opened it. Inside was an envelope. On which was written, Keep it. I don't want it anymore. Along with a copy of Pokemon Silver Edition, the original. I thought that was, a, that was great at the time, as I had fond memories of that game, and mine had run out of battery power, making it impossible to save the game. <coughs> Sorry. I grabbed my old Game Boy Advance SP and began my Yada. However, first I opened the envelope to see what was inside, and found a note with instructions to follow. Still to this day, I keep it along with the game, and it says, Hello, if you are reading this, it is because you have my game, and since I have given it to you, I ask you to please continue it up to the point I tell you in this letter, then you can play freely. Well, since you gave it to me, I thought, what less can I do for you? I read on. First, don't start a new game. Continue mine already saved. I have captured the three legendary dogs and I've given the GS ball to Caesar. So as soon as you go talk to him, you can capture Celebi. I have captured 248 Pokemon besides Celebi. I'm missing Lucia and Ho Ho. Please capture them and complete the Pokedex. Damn! What luck! He had practically handed it all to me on a golden platter. I was really looking forward to completing the Pokedex, so I got on with it. I continued a game that had already been started by its former owner and started checking its data. The trainer's name was S-U-S-E-J. A bit odd for a trainer's name, but I'll tell you but I'll tell what it means later if you can figure it out for yourselves. My team consisted of a Houndoom, a Lapras, and a Slowbro. At levels 36, 32, and 63 respectively, 
and a Sandshrew, an Abra, and a Pidgey at very low levels. Which I probably had used them to mo use them. I, which I probably had them to use the MOs. I had all 16 medals and the mummy, money limit. Playing time 662. Uh, 50. Or thereabouts. That made me think of the previous owner was a Matatiete. And the Poke Gear right about 11.50 p.m. on Saturday. The same time and day of the week as the one I was playing on. At the time, that just seemed like a coincidence to me. Once I knew my data, I s started playing. First, I captured Celebi, since I was in Azalea Village right at the start. And it was the closest one to me. I did the whole process. I talked to Caesar. I received the GS ball. Then I went to in Kansiar. I deposited it into the monuments to the Guardian of the Force, and the battle with Selby began. I was very excited to capture him, since without a special event, you can't get him. I caught him after a while, when I got tired of throwing normal Pokeballs at him, and threw a Master Ball out of three I had, and I got a message saying that he had been transferred to Bill's PC to Pandora's box. Pandora's box? I figured it was a joke. For those who don't know, Pandora's box is a myth. I think Greek, which says that if it's if it is opened, demons will come out of it. Things like that. And the human race will be doomed. Without giving it too much importance, since the name of the boxes would be could be changed. I continued and captured the other two legendaries I had left. It was easy, as I said before. I had the necessary Master Balls. Once I had captured all the legendaries and thus completed the Pokedex, I continued reading the instructions given to me by the former owner. 2. Now that you have captured all legendaries, create the following team. Mew, Celebi, Ho-Ho, Ho-Ho, Lugia, Suicune, and Moltres. Wait for the Pokegear to mark 3 o'clock a.m. to perform the next step. So it was 1 o'clock a.m. in the game, and since it marked the same time it actually was, I had to stay awake until 3 as well. I didn't mind. I was having a good time playing that game. I went to talk to Professor Oak to see what he would tell me about the Pokedex. Went to Azaluna City to get the diploma certifying that I completed the Pokedex. Defeated Red and took a look at the other boxes. The guy had even caught the four missing nose. I kept fooling around like that until I realized that it was already 2.45 a.m. I read the next step. Third, when it is 3 o'clock a.m., go to the Alpha Ruins. Enter the main chamber and go to the last statue following the corridor down. In front of it, put the unknown radio signal and talk to it. So I did. I went, went pulling towards the Alpha Ruins. I took the Magnet Train because I was in Kanto and from Triangle City to my destination I walked. I had plenty of time. When I, when I finally arrived it, it was 2.58 a.m. So I waited for two minutes in front of the statue from the, with the unknown radio signal on. The noise was making me quite nervous. When the Poké Gear finally read 3 o'clock a.m., I spoke to the statue. It admitted the cry for Pokémon, but it didn't sound like one I knew. The text boxes started popping up. Mew is gone, and Mew's cry. Celebi is no more, and her scream, and so on until the na they named all the Pokémon on my team. At the end, another text box came up. Your team's sacrifice was allowed the release of the Unknown King. When I closed the text box, the screen went black for about two seconds and then popped up on the King Unknown's page in the Pokedex, which went something like this. This ferocious beast can sleep for centuries, and when it wakes, it will kill anything for food. It had no number, and its cry was one that had sounded before. It was dark blue like Unknown, but its form only resembled them in the head. 
where it had three spikes, like a crown, and it had only one eye. Unlike the unknown, this one had a body, legs and arm ending in spikes stained red. I guess it could be for blood. Could be blood. When I closed the Pokedex, I appeared back where I had found the unknown king, and another message popped up saying, You have released the beast. When I closed it, the game automatically saved. I then had exactly 666 hours of gameplay. I looked at the equipment, but n now I had no Pokemon. The game started to get on my nerves. I left the chamber and headed to Mauve City to pick up some Pokemon from the PC. During the dive to said city, I noticed that there, there was something strange, plus the music from the unknown radio single signal kept playing everywhere I went, but I only noticed it as soon as I entered the Pokemon Center. There were no people. The NPCs had disappeared. When I looked inside the PC, I found out of the 20 practically full boxes, there were now only two Pokemon Pandora's box, level 20 Staryu and a, Sh and a Shanshu from before. I didn't know what was going on, so I was wandering all over Johnto. There are no NPCs in any town, no route, not even the houses. I read the next step of the note. Fourth, wait for the call. The call from whom? I don't know who was supposed to call me, so I opened a Poke Gear and looked at the numbers. Only Professor M's and Or Oro's mother were there. I called Professor M, but a message popped up saying he doesn't seem to be answering. When I called Oro's mother, I got the usual text. It was already 3.30 a.m. and still no one had called me back. I had already kicked almost all of Jonto, and there wasn't a single person, and there, was, there were no Pokemon in the grass either. Finally, the call came. It was from Oro's mother. It said, Son, please come home quickly. The cry of the unknown king sounded, and the call ended. Between the fever and the sleep, sleepiness, I had started to feel sick. But I wanted to know what was going on, and now I knew where to go. In my house, there was no one. However, upstairs there seemed to be a note on the wall, and it's, I read it, and it said, Fifth and last, go see Professor Oak. Before I left, I looked at the houses in Springtown to see if anyone was there. However, I already feared there were no one. Not one NPC in all of Jonto. Now I knew I had to go to Kanto. And since I couldn't take either the SSN or the Magneto train, then I understood why I just had those two Pokemon. So I could go surfing all the way to Kanto. However, before going to see Professor Oak, I took a walk around Kanto to see if anyone was there. There only seemed to be Mr. Fuji in Lavender Town. I talked to him and he said, I've been very busy lately. That's when I understood what was going on. The Unknown King had killed every person and Pokemon in the game. Hence what his Pokemon page said. After talking to the possibility, the last person in the game, I went to Pallet Town. I had no flight, but there were no Pokemon in the grass or water either. So it didn't take me long to get there. There was no one I... There either. Neither in Red's house nor in Blue's house. I entered Professor Oak's laboratory as expected. There is not even a person NPC, but where Professor Oak normally stands, there was the mini sprite of an unknown. I guess what I had to do, so I stood in front of it and pressed A. The cry of the unknown king sounded, and the battle against it began. He was level 100, and to top it off, equipped with several restore everything. He finished off my Pokemon in no time, but as soon as the last of my Pokemon was weakened, the battle continued. Gold was at level 10. I already knew I was not going to be able to do anything against that critter. I thought about turning off the console, but then I thought better of it. I told myself that if I didn't see how it ended, I would be intrigued because maybe this wouldn't happen to me again. After all, it was a game. What could happen to me? Oro knew the Lachey. 
but he didn't get used to it because the unknown king attacked first. He used bite and aura was weakened. Messers came out saying, S-U-S-E-J is dead. The screen went black for a few seconds, then a sprite of a man dressed in black appeared. As Professor Oak appears at the beginning of the game, he said the following to me. S-U-S-E-J, -E you just released a beast and doomed the human race. I couldn't have done it without you. Then the screen went black, and after a minute, the normal intro of the game started with Lugia flying in the blue sky. There was no previous saved game. I could only start a new one. It was already 4.30 a.m., so I turned off the console and tried to sleep since. Besides being sick, I felt very tired. That night, I dreamed that I was king unknown, and I was wandering around the world, looking for my next victim. I don't know if this was a morbid joke, or if it really had a supernatural origin. What I do know is that I was a month without stopping to think about it, and that every time I remembered it, my hair stands on end, and I even have nightmares about it from time to time. If it was a joke, which I hope it is, I think it was a joke of a Satanist or something. 3.30 a.m. is considered Satan's hour, which is coincided with the 666 hours of gameplay. S-U-S-C-J is Jesus in reverse. Not to mention the release of the beast. Of one thing, I am sure, having played that game, has left me scarred for life. And that's it. That is the curse of the unknown king. Ojiri? Sorry. <clears throat> I've been trying to listen, but Discord's been mainly uh, cutting you out so badly. There are times I'd unmute the stream just to hear something. Am I cutting off now? No, which kind okay. of pisses me off, honestly. <laughs> Cut out the majority of the story, but when you're over, oh yeah, Discord's playing fine. <laughs> uh... That was quite something, yeah. So I kind of liked oh. it, and then they went all weird with Saints and his shit. <laughs> yeah, that's. Cutting you out again. Okay, I'll be right back. Um. Bookworm said, so I kind of liked it, and then they went all weird Satanist shit. Yeah, I, at first I was confused by a sus EJ, e and then I realized, oh, it's Jesus. <laughs> uh... Alright, next one is Pokemon Black. Hopefully Discord won't cut me off this time. I hope so as well. Alright. Everyone ready? Alright, I'll take that as a yes. Three, two, one. I stumbled on this unsettling story of an obscure Pokemon bootleg that I thought might be the need to share on here. I think this originated from 4chan, so I have no idea if this hack actually exists. It probably doesn't, but it's still a great concept. I'm what you call a a collector of bootleg Pokemon games. Pokemon Diamond and Jade, Chaos Black, etc. It's amazing the frequency which with you can find them at pawn shops, Goodwill, flea markets, and such. They're generally fun, even if they are unplayable. And mistranslations and poor quality make them unintentionally humorous. I've been able to find most of the ones I've played online. But there's one that I haven't seen any mention of. I bought it at a flea market with about a five years ago. Oh, they... 
Wait a minute. They they put here's a picture of the car. They say here's a picture of the cartridge. But they don't show a picture of the cartridge. Okay. So just I'll probably figure it out on YouTube when I make this into a video. I'm sorry I can't show the actual picture of it. They just didn't provide one. Sorry about that. But anyway, back to the story. Here's a picture of the cartridge. In case anyone recognizes it. Unfortunately, when I moved two years ago, I lost the game. So I can't provide you with screen caps. Sorry. And the game started with a with the familiar Nidorino and Gengar intro of red and blue version. However, the press start screen had been altered. Red was there, but the Pokemon did not cycle through. It also said black version under the Pokemon logo. Upon selecting new game, the game started with Professor Oak's speech, and it quickly became evident that the game was essentially a Pokemon Red version. After selecting your starter, if you looked at your Pokemon, you had an, an addition to Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle, and another Pokemon, Ghost. The Pokemon was level 1. It had a sprite of the ghosts that are encountered in Lavender Town before obtaining the self scope. It had one attack, Curse. I know that there, there, was a, there is a real move named Curse. But the attack did not exist in Generation 1, so it appears it was hacked in. Defending Pokemon were unable to attack Ghost. It would only say they were too scared to move. When the move Curse was used in battle, the screen would cut to black. The cry of the defending Pokemon would be heard, but it was distorted. Played at much lower pitch than normal, the battle screen would then reappear and the defending Pokemon would be gone. If used in a battle against a trainer, when the Pokeballs were presenting their Pokemon would appear in the corner, they would have one fewer Pokeball. The implication was that the Pokemon died. What's even sh stranger is that after defeating a trainer and seeing Red receive $200 for winning, the battle com commands would appear again. If you selected run, the battle would end as it normally does. You could also select curse. If you did, upon returning to the overworld, the trainer's sprite would be gone. After leaving and re-entering the area, the spot where the trainer had been would be replaced with a tombstone, like the ones at Lavender Town. Move curse was not usable in all instances. It would fail against ghost Pokemon. It would also fail if it was used against trainers that you had you would have to face again, such as your rival or Giovanni. It was usable in your final battle against them, however. I figured this was the gimmick of the game, allowing you to use previously cap uncaptured ghosts, and because Curse made the game so easy, I essentially used it throughout the whole adventure. The game changed quite a bit after defeating the Elite Four. After viewing the Hall of Fame, which consisted of ghosts and a couple of very underlevel Pokemon, the screen cut to black. The box appeared with the, t with the words, many years later. It then cut to Lavender Town. A an old man was standing, looking at tombstones. You then realize this man was your character. The man moved at only half of your normal walking speed. You no longer had any Pokemon with you, not even Ghost, who up to this point had been impossible to remove from your party through depositing it in the PC. The world was entirely empty. There were no people at all. There are still tombstones of the trainers that you used Cursed on, however. You could go pretty much anywhere in the overworld at this point, though your movement was limited by the fact that you had no Pokemon to use HMs. And regardless of where you went, the music of Lavender Town continued on an infinite loop. After wandering for a while, I found that if you go through the Diglett's Cave, one of the cuttable bushes that normally blocks the path on the other side is no longer there, allowing you to advance and return to Pallet Town. Oh, 
upon entering your house and going to the exact tile where you start the game, the screen would cut the black. Then a spread of a caterpie appeared. It was replaced by a weedle and then a pidgey. I soon realized as the Pokemon progressed from Rattata to Blastoise that these were all the po of the Pokemon that I had used Cursed on. After the end of my rival's team, a youngster appeared, then a bug catcher. These were the trainers I had cursed. Throughout the sequence of the Lavender's Town music was playing, but it was slowly decreasing in pitch. By the time your rival appeared on screen, it was little more than a demonic's rumble. After a cut to black, a few moments later, the battle screen suddenly appeared. Your trainer sprite was now that of an old man, the same as the one who teaches you how to catch Pokemon in Viridian City. Ghost appeared on the other side along with the words, Ghost wants to fight. You couldn't use items, you had no Pokemon. If you tried to run, you couldn't escape. The only option was fight. Using fight would immediately cause you to use struggle, which didn't affect Ghost, but it did chip a bit of your own HP. When it was Ghost's turn to attack, it would simply say nothing. Eventually, when your HP reached a critical point, Ghost would finally use Curse. The screen cut to black a final time. Regardless of the buttons you press, you were apparently stuck in this black screen. At this point, the only thing you could do was turn the Game Boy off. When you played again, new game was the only option. The game had erased the file. I played through this hack game many, many times, and every time the game ended with a sequence. Several times I didn't use Ghost at all, though he was impossible to remove from the party. In these cases, it did not show any Pokemon or trainers, and simply cut to climatic battle with Ghost. I'm not sure what emotives were behind the creator of this hack. It wasn't widely disputed. So it's presumably not for monetary gain. It was very well done for a bootleg. It seems he was trying to convey a message, though it seems I am the sole receiver of this message. I'm not entirely sure what it was. The inevitability of death? Pointlessness of, of it? Perhaps he was simply trying to morbidly inject death and darkness into a children's game? Regardless, this children game has made me think, and it has made me cry. And that's it! That's, that's fucked up. <laughs> yeah! It was, it's very short, but it's fucked up. Yeah. It's a bit of nostalgia. Yeah, I agree, Ninji. That was... Yeah. That was really good. Yeah. And this was written back in 2010. Well, from the comments of the other story, I have a feeling this one was more well received. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people really liked it in the comments. Yeah. Now, another one that came a year later is more loved than Pokemon Black. And it's actually shorter. It's like only a two minute story. But it's really good. Everyone ready to hear it? Because it's the next one in line. Yeah, Alright. This is where the bad kids go. I must have been six or seven when I lived in Lebanon. The country was ravaged by war at the time, and murders were common and frequent. I remember during a particular vicious era, when the bombings rarely stopped, I would stay at home, sitting in front of my television, watching a very, very strange show. It was a kid's show that lasted about 30 minutes. It contained strange and sinister images. To this day, I believe it was a thinly veiled attempt on the part of the media to use scare tactics to keep kids in place. 
because the moral of every episode revolved around very uptight ideologies. Stuff like, bad kids stay up late. Bad kids have their hands under the covers when they sleep. And bad kids steal food from the fridge at night. It was very weird and in, and in Arabic to top it off, I didn't understand much of it. But for the most part, the images were very graphic and comprehensive. The thing that stuck with me the most, however, was the closing scene. It remained much the same in every episode. The camera would zoom in on an old, rusted, closed door. As it got closer to the door, sh strange and sometimes even agonizing screams would become more audible. It was extremely frightening, especially for children's programming. Then a text would appear on the screen in Arabic reading. That's where the bad kids go. Eventually, both the image and the sound would fade out. And that would be the end of the episode. About 15 or 16 years later, I became a journalistic photographer. That, sh that show had been in my mind all my life, popping up in my thoughts sporadically. Eventually, I had enough and decided to do some research. I finally managed to uncover the location of the studio where much of that channel's programming had been recorded. Upon further research and eventually traveling on site, I had found out it was now desolate and had been abandoned after the big war ended. I entered a building with my camera. It was burnt out from the inside. Either a fire had broken out or someone had wanted to incinerate all the wooden furniture. After a few hours of cautiously making my way into the studio and snapping pictures, I found an isolated, out-of-the-way room. After having to break through a few old locks and managing to break the heavy door open, I remained frozen in the doorway for several long mi minutes. Traces of blood Pieces and tiny bone fragments lay scattered across the floor. It was, it was a small room and an extremely morbid scene. What truly frightened me, though, which made me turn away and never want to come back, was the bolted, caged microphone hanging from the roof in the middle of the room. And that's it. Oh. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> that one sounds like the most realistic one yet, and that's what's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. For a reason. It's short, but it's really fucking good. Real horror is actual child abuse. <laughs> yeah. All right, what's next? Next is Containment. Which is actually funny since it's an SCP channel that there's a <laughs> random story that's called Containment. <laughs> the irony. <sighs> All right. Let's get this one on its way. A coward has many guises, and my bluff has been called. I'm not a brave man. I slept with a nightlight on until I was in my twenties. Yet here I am, Mr. Tough Guy, first line defense against forces unknown. Forces that were unknown until we went poking around in the dark, looking for them. The warning signs were all there. All I had to do was accept them. Now look at where I am. This whole situation's a mess. Eventually, ev this whole situation's a mess. Everything is out of hand, and it's all my fault. Now the only way for forward is with uncertainty, fear, and trepidation. I should have pulled a plug on operations. 
There was more than enough conclusive data to suggest possible containment failure. But no, I just had to go and poke the preferable bear with the quantum stick. What could go wrong, I thought. I've always known certain inherent dangers came with the job. But I was in charge of local containment. I rarely ever got to see a subject in its natural habitat. I spent most of my time in the lab, so I jumped on the opportunity to assist in live capture. Funds were sparse. They always were. That's the thing about clandestine operations. It's hard to fund something that doesn't exist, so I was our only available containment expert. It was my job to ascertain an evaluation of success. On my initial assessment, I concluded we were understaffed and underfunded. But I purposefully overlooked some minor details and issued a passing score. It was a class two assignment, a simple grab the and bag job. Myself, Agent Claveres, and the youngest rookie I've ever met, Agent Thompson, pulled up in a work van dressed in gas company uniforms. The bag had occurred in the basement of an old two-story house. I was so excited I forgot to unbuckle my seatbelt before I stepped out the van. I felt the strap bite into my shoulder as I lurched forward. Shit, I said. This isn't the, the time to be clumsy, grumbled Agent Calveras as he crossed himself and slid out of the driver's seat. I didn't know you were rebellious. Uh, or sorry, I didn't know you were re religious. I said, unbuckling and sliding out of my seat. Agent Claveras walked around the van and opened the side door. Only on the job, he responded. The rookie hopped out of the back and scanned the surrounding darkness. When will our backup arrive? He asked. We're looking at it, Agent Calveras grunted. Why would we need a backup for a Class 2? I asked. I thought Class 2s were easy. There is nothing else about what we do, kid. Oh, sorry. There's nothing easy about what we do, kid. Said Agent Calveras as he strolled up the sidewalk to the house, pausing to open the gate. After you, he said, waving me through the opening. For the first time since I had accepted the assignment, I was rethinking my initial excitement. In my job, I find a subject's weaknesses and teach others how to exploit them. Somehow, I had forgotten how much damage she th these things can do, the extent of which I have yet to see for myself. Sure, I've dealt with plenty of Class II subjects in the lab, usually heavily sedated and in a secure cage, but I've never been near an anomalous subject without arduously strict guidelines and fail-safes in order. In the field, anything can happen, and I was standing at the threshold of uncertainty with nothing between myself and madness but a cherry red door ready to be opened, like a new chapter in life eager to write itself into existence. It beckoned me, hurling me, hurling me toward the danger, pointing toward the darker depths of truth. A.J. Calveras turned the knob and pushed the door open. There was no turning back. We stood for a moment, staring into the dark entryway. At my request, we had, his, had the power shut off which increased the safety of operations by 2%. Only a fool would have left it on. It was weird how normal it looked. Just a house, clean and orderly, with a fresh pine scent emanating from within. As I stepped across the threshold, my hair stood on end, and a tingling sensation crawled across my skin, sending a shiver down my spine. Bet you've never felt that before, 
Heavy dark, ancient thoughts of a friend leading my way to the back of the house. I never get used to it, Agent Calvera said as he removed the stun gun from, his, from under his jacket. Temporal displacement, I said. Temporal this what now? Asked Agent Thompson, removing a small device from his pocket. It's what responsible for the goose pimples, if you will. I responded. As soon as we get finished here, I'm writing a book about it, said Agent Thompson. Sure thing, Shakespeare, I said. Are you getting smart with me, Doc? Asked Agent Thompson, turning to face me, his eyes narrowing to two beady slits. I hadn't realized how imposing he was. He had a grizzled masculinity that, until that moment, I hadn't noticed. For that matter, I have never even heard of the guy before we left Ark. I didn't mean anything by it, I said. I'm sure you didn't, he responded, clapping me on the shoulder. We had made our way through the house to the kitchen. To the back of the room was the door to the basement. I could hear my pulse beating in my ears, my resolve melting away more and more with each step. Depending on what species subject came through the anomaly, it may be able to hear my racing heart. Perhaps it can sense our pheromones, and knows we are closing in for the capture. Calm down, Doc. It's only a class two, right? Choked Agent Calveras as he readied himself to open the door. He crossed himself once more, and turned the knob to another unknown destination. The door opened into the kitchen, exposing a flight of stairs that plunged into the darkness below. The rookie pulled a flashlight from his belt and turned it on, covering it with his fingers to dim the light. As the rookie passed his light over to me, he paused. Where's the fucking cage? Sorry. Where's the fucking cage? He asked. Agent Calveras turned in front of the stairs to face me. What kind of containment expert are you? He snapped at me. I I forgot it. I, I've never been in the field before. I stammered. There was a sound in the basement. An icy whistle rose from the darkness. I heard... Yeah, All right, there we go. I restarted stream. I'm going to read back to where... I'm going to go up a bit. Because I don't know where it went. But it stopped at. So I'm going to start right here. Hopefully, it didn't get rid of too much. Sorry to everyone. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, about that. I don't know why it disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on what species subject came through the anom anomaly, it may be able to hear my racing heart. Racing and sense our pheromones and know knows we are closing in for the capture. Calm down, Doc. It's only a class two, right? Choked Agent Calveras as he readied himself to open the door. He crossed himself once more and turned the knob to another unknown destination. The door pulled, pulled open into the kitchen, exposing a flight of stairs that plunged into the darkness below. The rookie pulled a flashlight from his belt and turned it on, covering it with his fingers to dim the light. As the rookie passed the flashlight over to me, he paused. Where's the fucking cage? He asked. Agent Calveras turned in front of the stairs to face me. What kind of containment expert are you? He 
is snapped up. I, I forgot. I, I've never been in a field before. I stammered. There was a sound from the basement. An icy whistle rose from the darkness. I heard the stairs creak, and before Agent Thompson could get his flashlight fixed on the ground, on the sound, a lightning fast streak lunged up the stairs and struck Agent Calveras in the chest. Agent Calveras flew across the kitchen, slamming into the stove. He clutched at the creature, managing to throw it off into the pots and pans hanging above his head. The creature was back on him before the first pan hit the ground. Get it off! Yelled Agent Calveras. Contain! Contain! I was frozen. I couldn't move. I could see blood forming on Agent Calveras' chest and arms. Such appeared to be a Class II scripper. They're not very big, but they make up for it with thick skin and razor-sharp everything. And ferocity. It was all Agent Calveras could do to keep it at bay. Contain! He kept shouting as the skipper lashed and lunged and gnawed at his arms and chest. Agent Calveras fell to the floor, grabbed the oven door, opening it as he fell. Seizing the opportunity, I punted the skip scripper into the oven and slammed it shut, pressing it against it to keep it closed. Took you long enough, Agent Calveras grunted, rising to his feet. His chest and arms looked shredded, even in the dark. Scripper thrashed around in the oven so hard I struggled to keep it shut. Agent Calveras grabbed the chair and slid it under the handle. Once I was confident the door was going to hold, I stood. Where's the kid? Agent Calveras asked. In all the commotion, I didn't notice he was missing. The door to the basement door stood open. There was a soft glow of light in the basement, just enough for the to see the bottom of the stairs. Agent Calveras approached the stairwell. Agent Thompson. A Agent Thompson? Oh, sorry, that's not his voice. Agent Thompson? He called down the stairs before turning to me. Find the stun gun, he said. Started down the stairs. Do you think there's more of them? I asked when I searched the kitchen for the stun gun. It, it doesn't seem likely there's two, does it? Not likely. But not impossible, either. Agent Calveras responded before continuing. For our sake, let's hope it's another scripper, not something else. I found the stun gun underneath the counter on the far side of the kitchen. These aren't your garden variety stun guns. They aren't electric. Instead, they rely on a focus frequency unique to the anomaly. For some reason, electricity seemed to feed most anomalous beings. Imagine your favorite zoo animal, oh, popped up on metaphetamines, and then you then teach it on how to use a gun, and it would still be less dangerous. I clutched the gun in my hand. I felt ridiculous holding it. It wasn't part of my training. I wasn't even authorized to use it. Nevertheless, I went to the stairs at in time to see Agent Calveras turn the corner into the basement, and I started my descent. When I reached the landing, Agent Calveras stood in the middle of the basement holding the rookie's flashlight. I stopped in my tracks as I saw what I was looking at. Agent Thompson stood in front of an open anomaly. I had never seen one before. It was as if someone had unzipped a tent flap to another world. He turned to look at us, and even as he did, his face morphed and contorted into countless shapes, his grin ever present among them. I raised the gun as at what was once Agent Thompson. He raised his arms at his sides and started to levitate. He was at least a foot off the ground. What are you doing? Shoot! Agent Calvary shouted. The imposter before us started to laugh, his face an, an ever-changing, convoluted mess. The basement shook and and for all I knew, the whole world was quaking. I felt defenseless. I couldn't think, let alone move. A shadow loomed over the other side of the anomaly, and a voice spoke from somewhere amongst the ever-changing portions of Agent Thompson's face. You shall live for now, for it was you amongst my enemies foolish enough to release me. 
before I can pull the trigger, a giant tentacle tore through the anomaly and pulled whatever he was through. There was a sickening pop as the anomaly seemed to implode upon itself, folding smaller and smaller until there was nothing right. but myself. Yeah? I don't want to interrupt you, but the last part I heard was you will live for now. Is this going to cut me off again? God fucking damn it, Discord! Fuck off! Sorry about that, guys. Twitch. Sorry. You shall live for now. For it was you amongst my enemies foolish enough to release me. Before I could pull the trigger, a giant tentacle tore through the anomaly and pulled whatever he was through. There was a sickening pop as the anomaly seemed to implode upon itself. Folding smaller and smaller until there was nothing but myself and Agent Calveras in the basement. You don't see that often. Agent Calveras turned to the stairs. That's it? Bradley screamed. That's your takeaway? Yeah, I did my job. The anomaly's closed, said an Agent Calveras, struggling as he climbed the stairs. We have to at least talk about what we just saw. I snapped, following up him up the stairs. I believe you have a job to finish, Agent Calvera said as he stepped into the kitchen, motioning to the oven. The door to the oven stood open. The chair that held it was sh shut with some splinters, and a familiar whistle from somewhere in the house. I'll be in the van, Agent Calvera smirked as he made his way toward the front house. What? You can't be leave alone with that thing? I fumed. You can't be serious. He said it yourself, Doc. It's only a class two. How serious can it get? And that's it. Is it bad that I feel like he earned that last part? Probably, yeah. This feels like something that could be an SCP story. It very well could. I like that. Yeah. Definitely has that SCP tail feel to it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it definitely does. I wonder if Scott Terrace ever wrote any SCP stories, because this is because that's the right author of this story. Because it seems like they can do it. I agree. Alright, that means there's only one SCP, not SCP, one story left. God damn it. Got SCPs on the mind. Okay, that's fine. And it's Hypno's Lullaby. Mm -hmm. Alright. <clears throat> That's not fair. Jimmy cried, slamming his large gray Nintendo DS shut. You cheat! I told you never to use your blast toys. His number was too high. Preston smirked through Jimmy's voice, made him glance at the metallic picnic table across the playground, where Miss Hilton sat reading some book. I really don't want to see her take my game away again, he thought. He was a smaller blue DS so that the Pokemon sticker showed on the front and tucked it between his legs, just in case she looked up. No one likes you, you Pokemon freak! Jimmy said. His limbs shook and his face turned red. For a moment, Preston thought Jimmy looked like a red version of the Hulk. He felt a smile coming on, but forced it back. Any more attention would alert Miss Hilton. Miss Hilton. Jimmy just stood over him, fists clenched, but finally just walked away. 
Pressed his side, tucking his game system in his pocket. Kids played sharp in the sandbox and swung one another on swings. Pressed his side, staring at them, but then turned away. He had a lot of friends, after all. Pokemon. So he brushed dirt off his po Pokemon shirt with Ash and Pikachu. Alright, hold on a moment. Uh, okay, see you later, Ninji, and uh... No promises to no containment breaches. <laughs> yeah, have a good night. So he brushed dirt, dirt off his Pokemon shirt with Ash and Pikachu and sat under the tree nearest the forest on the darkest outskirts of the playground. Acorn's head in the golden orange leaf flared the ground as, and as Pat Preston sat his back scraped against the tree's trunk. The boy cast another glance at his teacher before he took the DS out of his shorts pocket. He opened it and pressed the power button, but stopped when he caught something out of the corner of his eye. At first glance, it looked like a yellow speck. Though the more Preston looked at it, the more it looked like a... A hypno? Preston blinked, expecting the image to be gone, but there it sat, swinging its pendulum, a gray stone, with a hollow center attached to a string, to and fro. Its cat-like ears perked up, and a long nose was nestled between two squinted eyes. Oh, Preston said, placing his DS on the ground, slowly getting up, and hit note, sat, as it was watching its pendulum go back and forth. Person crept toward it, making sure that his foot rose high enough and fall, fell gently as to not make a sound. Whenever the Pokemon glanced in Preston's direction, he darted behind a tree. They are real. I knew it. If only I had a Pokeball. The closer the boy got, the more he noticed some things about Hypno. The first was that the Pokemon's face looked rough and paper-like. Almost as though it was made of what was its ends. But what, what was Miss Hilton helped us make our hoeing mess out of? Paper mache. And its eyes were more set back, as though Hypno wore a mask. His skin looked more like a yellow long sleeve shirt and pants, but he wore no shoes. He kind of looks like Hypno, Preston thought, but no more had he thought than he realized that everything looked different in a cartoon than reality, like how Tom and Jerry looked goofier than a regular cat and mouse. Preston felt a foot fell on a twig. A piece of wood broke in a resounding snap. Pokemon looked up at the boy, his pendulum coming to a halt. Preston froze. A breeze seemed to carry the sounds of the other children off, so it seemed that only the boy and the Pokemon remained. He expected the Hypno to run, but all it did was tilt its head to the side. Come, little child. Come with me. Safe and happy you will be. The Pokemon sang, though its squeaky voice, hardly higher than a whisper. Person's eyes widened. You can talk, the boy said. You don't even move your mouth. I am a psychic type Pokemon, Hypno said. I don't need to speak to talk. With that, he raised a hand and poked his head. Oh, Preston said. Away from home, now let us run. The Hypno saying once more, extending a hand. With Hypno, he'll have so much fun. Preston smiled, taking a step forward. Finally, he had a real live Pokemon. He could live with Hypno and help train him. Maybe I, I can even catch more Pokemon with Hypno's help. Preston! Hypno's eyes narrowed with deep eye holes. Miss Henson had her eyes round had her hands around her mouth, calling for the boy. Preston raised a hand and turned to follow the other kids back to primary school. When he glanced back, Hypno was gone. Preston 
Preston grabbed his DS and rushed back to class with his classmates, though his thoughts remained on the playground. When the class moved on with the day, taking turns during activities like drawing or playing math games, Preston snuck over to the window and stared off into the woods. There was nothing but the swaying trees. Dumb Miss, Miss Henson, the boy thought. He scared Hypno away. The thought made his eyes water, but he forced them back. He wouldn't cry. Preston blinked a few times, though, when he opened his eyes again and focused them. Just at the edge of the trees, he noticed Hypno standing with a slight stoop, swinging his pendulum back and forth. You are f such a fucking idiot! Preston heard his mo mother through the bedroom walls. He turned up the volume on his game, laying on his bed and holding the console above his head. Why? Because I want, want to leave this place, his dad said. Preston placed his DS aside and glanced over at the clock on his bedside table. The clock in the grip of the plastic Pikachu said 10.34 and the glows in the dark numbers. Music blared from the game, though he still heard his parents as though they were in the same room. So you want him to take... So you want to take him away? The one place he's grown up in? You want to take him away from that? He's he's only eight years old, for fuck's sake. Preston rolled off his Pokemon bedspread, allowing his eyes to adjust after playing his Pokemon game for close to three hours straight. Pokemon posters covered the whole walls. The one thing that separated them were sliver, slivers of light blue wall. He thought of putting in a movie. Maybe that could be louder than the fighting. But then again, he was supposed to be sleeping. Maybe he could draw, but he would need light. Playing with his action figures, maybe too much noise. And needed light. So he just sighed, hopped back to bed, and tucked himself back to bed. Into bed. Preston head held the DS back over his head. The light of the game allowing him to see the cuffs of his fleece Pokemon pajamas. Tomorrow will be better, he thought. It's Halloween, and a field trip to the caves. A smile crawled across his lips. Then he noticed about his game was the only noise he heard. His tense little body relaxed as though on cue his eyes. He felt his eyelids get heavy. Preston moved his head, hand to turn off the DS, but stopped. He put his game on pause, then opened up his Pokedex. The... the compendium of all the monsters he had caught in the game. He scrolled down the long list until the cur cursor highlighted Pokemon number 96. A hypno appeared on the sh screen with its yellow skin, squinty eyes, and pendulum. Preston read the description. It carries a pendulum-like device. There once was an incident in which it took a away a child it, it hypnotized. I wish I could take you would take me away, Preston said. He turned off his game, placed it on his bedside table, and closed his eyes. All right, everyone, Miss Hilton said. Be careful. These caves can be very dangerous, so stay behind me and watch where you walk. Preston took to the end of the line of children, looking around at the towering pines behind him. Pines around him. The golden light of autumn shined through the leaves, and the smell of grass and dirt filled them. They walked around a large hole in the ground, which they found as they pressed was a cave. The day shined in from an opening at the bottom. The children craned their necks to see a gray stone a yard away. The ground sloped downhill as they reached the bottom. The cave mouse stood ready to welcome them. Miss Henson entered with the others following her. All of them craned their necks up to see the huge hole that they had just passed. Princeton smiled. He had expected the caves to be more like they were in his game. Brown, geometric, precise. Miss Hudson muttered something about noticing how they could see erosion where to rock down. Preston didn't listen, though just gazed up and around. 
His gaze fell to the cave opening. He thought he saw a flash of yellow in the woods. Around midday, the class took out their lunches. Preston found a particularly leafy piece of ground and plopped down. He laid out a tin Pokemon lunchbox he had retrieved from the bus and opened it. Inside lay a peanut butter and jelly sandwich stuffed into a bag and a box of Minute Maid apple juice. He sighed. Why does Mom keep making the same lunch? Nevertheless, Preston grunted and picked up his plastic wrapped sandwich. Psst! Preston glanced around, looking for the one who pissed him. Everyone else paid him no mind. It couldn't have come from behind. Thought there was nothing but woods behind him. Again, Preston sighed, probably just for someone else. He felt a knot tighten in his chest. Preston looked up, envying all the children who talked or played together. It was times like these that he wished he had his Pokemon game. Psst! Half behind a tree and a half hidden by the green shrubbery stood Hypno with his stooped posture and swinging his pendulum. Preston smiled, and after making sure no one was watching him, edged toward the shrubbery. Hello, little child, Hypno said, cocking his head to the left like a bird. Hi, Hypno, Preston said, trying to keep his voice down. Why did you run away yesterday? I don't like adults seeing. Hypno said. Why? They don't like Pokemon. <laughs> oh, Preston said, nodding his head. No wonder why Miss Henson was always trying to take away his Pokemon game. What's the name, little child? I'm Preston. Preston Michaels. Well, Preston. He said, I have something to show you. Hypno gestured behind him with his free hand, and then he turned and walked into the forest. Preston glanced back as usual. Everyone's attention was everywhere but him. He turned and followed his Pokemon into the foliage. A shrubbery clung to Preston's chain, making him stop every so often to wrench his legs from the thicket. Hypno walked ahead, his right arm always held out, swinging his pendulum. The smell of wet fruit made Preston's nose wrinkle every time he broke a large weed. Sweat formed on the bridge of his nose, and he kept having it wipe it away and push up his glasses. It only took five minutes of walking before two entered a tiny clearing. Hypno stopped in front of a hole in the ground. One like Preston had seen earlier that day, but smaller, perhaps only a meter in length and width. The boy glanced over his shoulder. He could just see the, the class and Miss Henson past the trees and foliage. Preston's shoulder slumped a little. No one was even missing me. The boy forced back a hiccup that seemed to be trying to force its way back up. And then turned to see Hypno still staring down. Preston glanced down into the hole. It looked deep and dark. The smell of wet earth and something else drifted up from it. Preston wrinkled his nose. What is that place? The boy asked. It's my home. Hypno said for the first time. Preston noticed that the Pokemon's voice seemed muffled. Why do you live in, in a place like that, Hypno? I have no owner, Hypno said. I have nowhere else to go. Me, me neither, Preston said, though his voice sounded small. There it was again, that lump in his chest. He wanted to be one of the, the kids the others played with. He wanted to be one of the kids whose parents never fought and paid attention to them. Tears slid down his cheeks. No one loves me. Hypno loves you, Hypno said, bending over to look Preston in the face. The boy could see every ridge 
when the Pokemon masked like face. Princess's lip quivered, and he wrapped his arms around Hypno. I'm so lonely, Preston said, hugging the Pokemon tighter. Hypno shhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
His voice made the boy shiver even more. For you, your families will grieve. Minds unraveling at the seams, allowing me to hunt their dreams. Please, Preston said. Hypno stood. He swung his pendulum back and forth, but it seemed to shine in dim light. Each time it would hit the light, it made Preston squint. Hypno moved closer. Don't cry, Preston. Hypno said, squeaking in the same low, squeaky voice. Preston tried to crawl back. Blood ran down his arms and leg. Do not wail and do not weep. It is, it's, it's time for you to go to sleep. Hypno sang, his voice heightened as he sang, making Preston scream louder. Hypno's eyes widened, though only a bit of them was visible through the ice slits. Little chip, child, you're not clever. Now you'll stay with me forever. Hypno's lullaby. Come, little children, come with me. Safe and happy you will be. Always away from home, now let us run. With Hypno, you'll have so much fun. Oh, little children, please don't cry. Hypno wouldn't hurt a fly. Be free to frolic and be free to play. Come with me to my cave to stay. Oh, little children, please don't squirm. These ropes I know will hold you firm. Now look at me, the pendulum calls. Back and forth, your eyelids fall. Oh, little children, you cannot leave. For you, your families will grieve. Minds unraveling at the seams, allowing me to haunt their dreams. Do not wail and do not weep. It's time for you to go to sleep. Little children, you are not clever. Now you will stay with me forever. And that's it. That's the final story of tonight. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> it became popular. <laughs> Probably because it mainly because the hypnosis lullaby. I see why it became popular. I think, I, even though I said I was going to do that SCP podcast. I think I'm going to do one that's just solo, or it's just me reading uh, horror stories or creepypasta stories. I, I want to see... what people are into that. But the thing is, I, with my voice acting, as you can tell, I did different voices. <laughs> uh... I just want uh, both of your opinions. Let's see if you would like to see that. I would be interested in it. Bookworm? Yeah, that sounds interesting. Okay. Then this will technically be the first podcast thing. Because <laughs> I was already going to put all the horror stories that I read from the creepypasta stuff, put it all together, and upload as a creepypasta thing. Which means I actually do have to do editing. Fuck. You have to do editing anyway. Well, I wasn't going to mess with my story until we do the fixes. Uh. Yeah, so I really I had no editing to do. <laughs> well, I mean, I could take some of the games I did earlier and make them to videos. The Bad Dream series, I was going to do a, a Twitch exclusive. What I could do, to, there is no game as a, like, you know, as its own thing. I could do that. If I wanted to. Yeah. But yeah.
So, out of curiosity, Bookworm Jiri, which story out of all the stories you heard tonight creeped you out the most? The last one, honestly. <laughs> it knows lullaby. I remember sending you the story, but you didn't read it. No, I didn't. I when I saw the title, I honestly thought it was a different Pokemon fanfiction. I was wrong. No, yeah, no, it's a creepy story. <laughs> Specifically targeting the most vulnerable child. Uh, I hate that it makes sense. Yeah. They called the kid not smart, but it's literally what any child would do. Uh, Pokemon like really liked Black Pokemon Black, but all him and Soul by was close. Oh. Um... Yeah, Pokemon Black was also kind of creepy, in its own way. Granted, like, it didn't, like, kill the protagonist or anything, you know, like, in real life, but, like, it was still creepy. I'm actually kind of curious, can you actually buy a hacked version of that game on Amazon or something like that? No, I don't. Oh yeah, I forgot there's an already game called Pokemon Black. Smart. Okay. Yeah, good luck with so good luck with searches. Cause if it's actual game to play, I would play it. Oh my gosh, there's a ROM hack for it. I don't know how to do ROM hacks. Oh wait. Okay, so I actually did find a site. One site where you can... Pl uh, two sites where you can download it. But one of them looks sketchy, so I'm not going to trust that one. So yeah, no, this is an actual game you can play. That's awesome. That was probably made at, uh, made after the stories. Yeah, I know there's like a few that were made after stories. You probably need an emulator or something like that. Yeah, well, the luck, luckily the, the the downloaded one that I found. Oh God damn it! Give me a moment. Luckily, the downloaded one I found. You you download both the game and the hack. Of the game, so it's like all together, so that's good. <laughs> I don't have to use an emulator or anything. Yeah, I also eventually, after I get all my series caught up, it's gonna take a while, but I want to, I want to see what you guys think about this. Do um. My favorite Pokemon game of all time, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, but I'll have to use an emulator for it. I can't say I am, but I'll have to. I just have to figure out where my emulator device is. Because I have one. As well as my GameCube controller. I used to have a GameCube, but 
the piece that connects the disc to the machine broke, so it's it was too expensive to fix. You mean you have a totally special version of the OG hardware? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Anyways, um Book on last words go. Hypno is coming for you. You'd better like, comment, subscribe and follow Bright to join her Serpent's Hand sect for protection. Interesting last words. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you heard it, Cherry? I read it. Ah. Uh. Hey, Cherry, last words go. Everyone have a wonderful night, and I hope your parents are a little nicer than Rattlers. Did you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my last words is, um, shoot, uh, how am I going to do this? If you watch this VOD on Twitch, uh, at me on Twitter if you want to read a certain uh, creepypasta. Yeah, I'm your last words. Anyway, uh, I hope you Danger News enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time for your next experiment.